You know the day destroys the night Night divides the day Try to run, try to hide Break on through to the other side Break on through to the other side God bless America. Welcome to The Ranch, everybody, the podcast where we explore the people and happenings of Dry Creek Ranch and the surrounding Eagle area. My guest today was awesome. He's somebody we have all come to lean on for fresh produce. He farms the Dry Creek Ranch farm, supplies us with giant bags full of cucumbers and tomatoes and root vegetables and salads and things of that nature, and has really become kind of a figurehead in Dry Creek Ranch, because before him, we actually didn't have a farm in Dry Creek Ranch. It was awesome talking to him and hearing about what it's actually like to try to run a farm that produces a good amount of produce, especially one that's trying to feed our community. So I greatly appreciate the man. I greatly appreciate the conversation. And I think you will too. So without further ado, the man, the myth, the legend, Farmer Dan. Sir, <laughs> thank you for coming. My God. Hey, cheers. God bless you. Not drinking <laughs> Arizona great. today. How is that compared to the Arizona ice tea? It's not quite as good, but it's close. And it's, it's, so it's, it's in the, I mean, something about out of a can feels a little colder, right? <laughs> it's definitely gratifying. I really yeah, liked smoothly. Arizona iced tea when I was in high school. And then uh, I was dating this girl whose mom was like this. I don't even know how she found out about this. Because, like, look, pre, pre-social pre media, how do we get outraged about things? <laughs> like, 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 hear me yeah. out. Because she was t- – I was like, oh, Arizona iced tea. Like, yeah. we're stopping at a gas station or something. Uh-huh. So I go inside. I'm like, oh, let me get an Arizona iced tea. I wasn't even asking them to buy it. And this girl was like, no, no, you can't get that. I'm like – Wait, how do you mean it? There, there are plenty right there. She's like, no, 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 my mom won't be happy about it. Like, what? why does your mom care about iced tea? So something? apparently there was something having to do with like they had stolen a logo from some Native American oh, tribe in Arizona right. or something. I, I okay. can't remember exactly. I could see that. Being but like, yeah. I, I, heard, I was like, well, that's kind of silly. Like, well, uh, whatever. And of course, I'm not going to argue with this girl's mom. So I don't get the iced tea. But thinking about that later, it's like, how would you have come by that information? I mean, this is like 1998. Yeah. Right, like you barely had Netscape, right? Like we had AOL <laughs> yeah. online. Yeah. How do you find out that somewhere in Arizona there's a Native American tribe who's had their logo stolen by stolen by some caffeine and sugar peddling tea company? Right. It. It. it who knows? Like who knows? it was like <laughs> some publication somewhere. Like yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I mean, journalism I think was better at that time. <laughs> So well, I, I feel um, like, you know, it, I, I feel like you like maybe trust the sources a little bit more. Like, Yeah, but like, yeah, I like, believe that. Yeah, you know what I mean? Um, but, but yeah, it, it, it's so fast with social media now. And yeah. You just, it just takes off. <laughs> it's it gets a, a life of its own. It's, uh, yeah. And I mean, it, it, we saw with COVID just how immediate, like we had that month or two where it was everybody kind of like, oh, we're all going to come together. And then, and then, and then the culture war took over like immediately. Like, <laughs> yeah. uh, and then it, everything became a signal, a virtue signal, like, you know, so it was, it, 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 it's tough to, to navigate that kind of stuff in today's world. It is. Because of social media. I think it's just, everything's ramped up to 10 immediately. A thousand. There, okay, so back in uh, back in Danville, there's this guy who's running for the board of education, right? So the board of education has a few seats coming up, and this one guy Jesse, who has five kids and they're young kids, and he has three of them in the school district. One is too young to be in the school district, and one did request, I think, like a year ago, he's like, "Hey, Dad, can I go to this private school?" You know, and, and Jesse had the the means to say, like, "All right, look, we'll make this work." It, it's a private school or homeschool, one of, one of the two. Mm-hmm. Anyway, the point is, the majority of his kids are in the school district, and the union reaches out to him. And says, hey, Jesse, you're running for a board of education. We would like you to take our endorsement, right? And this endorsement, of course, comes with some money for campaign uh, campaign finance mm-hmm. and some other stuff, right? And he's like, you know, I support the teachers union. I, I support the teachers Absolutely. But I don't think it's a good idea to – for me as a candidate and I don't think it's a good idea for the people that I would be representing to you know, be taking money from private, private interests. So, of course, instantaneously, the president of the teachers union goes online and starts blasting him saying he doesn't support teachers. He doesn't support the teachers union. He's not like for us, all these things. And just like you were saying, it go- ramps up to 10 instantaneously and of course all of this all of these lies are being spread all over the place about this guy just because he wouldn't take money from the teachers union he, right. and he thankfully was able to come out and made this like short video like hey look this is what the situation and this is the letter that I, he read this letter that like i support everyone i just don't think that we need money coming from different groups that have you know uh their own interests in what the board does and 
man, it's just it's outrage, like yeah. instantaneously. Yeah. And and what's frustrating is like, so a, a lot of the people who he would like to reach because the algorithms and the incentive structure, like right. it, 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 that his message might not get to a lot of people. And it's right. like, it, 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 it's, it, it's, it's tough there too. Cause like, I mean, I mean, these uh, Jonathan Haidt talks, talks a lot about this <laughs> stuff, um, it, it, social media and, and just the incentive structure of them to basically keep eyeballs. Yes. And so it makes your tribe that much more insular. Um, it, and, but at the same time, it's also, throwing you stuff that you're going to disagree with because that's more engaging. Right. And so you, it keeps your eyeballs on there. So they're like, they're harvesting our outrage. And I, I, in some ways, I wish I could be off of it. Um, well, I mean, but you, I mean, you've you got to communicate, like cucumbers right? cucumbers all day long or something. Right? Yeah. Like, like you, you have largely yeah. managed to find a way to insulate yourself from a lot of the atrocious stuff that most people slog through, right? Like you, right. you don't have to cultivate a social media platform to do your farming, right? Yeah, right. And I, you know, it's one thing I want to do better at, actually. I, like, I, I, there, I think there are some aspects to a lot of it that, that, that are good. Obviously, they're, they're, they're just, it's always trade offs. Um, sure. And um, I, I, I want to do better at it, specifically Instagram stuff because I mean, pictures of farm stuff is always good. People love it. And I just haven't done it. I haven't really had the time. And I just got out of the habit of doing it. I might even try and hire somebody from the community. I can imagine. Dude, I'll like, help you. Like a, I'll help you a thousand percent. You don't even have to pay me. And even like a, like, like, I'm more like a teenager to come out and just do a couple posts a week type thing. Yeah. And yeah, I mean, and I, I, I can do it. I just, um, and I, I got an eye for like the pictures and stuff yeah. to take, but I just, I haven't, um, I don't know. It could be a fun thing. I, I, I've been brainstorming about it. I, I, I want to do better at the social media stuff and do more quick videos and stuff on what's going on on the farm. So, yeah. like, I, I, yeah, I, I, I haven't been very active. Part of it is just, like, my little bit of revulsion. It's more like Twitter that I think is the real cesspool. Instagram, in, Instagram, if you can, like, like the just, – just follow the people you want to follow and – um, it, what I've heard is like make it close. Like like I follow a bunch of other farms and stuff, and a lot of times I have to take it away because like they're like bigger farms and doing better stuff, and it's like it, then I'm then I'm comparing myself to somebody else. Yeah, and, well, they and appear I, to be don't want doing to do, better stuff. It, it, they appear right. to be bigger and <laughs> better, right? Like that's the thing. Too. You have yeah. no idea. Like uh, say acreage, yes, they're bigger, but. Everything is from an angle. Right. Like everything yeah. is a spin. Yeah. Like you're like, damn, that cucumber looks better or like that yeah. kale looks better or like they got dinosaur kale. And like, yeah. I mean, the, all of that stuff <laughs> is just – it's all a facade. Right. It, it, it and, and the farming picks are – the perfect analogy for that. I just so like you know, I'll, I'll be zoomed in on like the one cucumber stuff. And if I were to zoom out, if I were to step back two feet, you'd see how what crap the rest of it is. Like all falling over, and it's like you know, all these leaves are brown and dead. And like, but like I zoom in, and it looks pristine. And, and that is just the perfect representation of what social media can be for a lot of people's lives. So it like, looks like these perfect lives, and then like you, you step back a second, or 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 you like <laughs> after the camera goes off. It, it, you know, the, the, the home life isn't as good, you know, all that stuff, you know, it's like, it's just a perfect analogy of like, you know, like, yeah, when we're trying to like promote ourselves and like, give a project the best aspects of what we're doing with our life or on the farm. Um, yeah, a lot of times that, you know, there, you're, you're not going to do the other stuff. So I do kind of make it a point to like, sometimes I will in, in, in the past I have, I've been farming for about 10 years. So like in the past I have like zoomed out and been like, look at this mess that like, because I didn't get to it and it's a, you know, it's showing people the struggle of it too. So, you know, I, I, I do try to do that, but <laughs> For the most part, yeah. When you're looking at like social medias and stuff, it's like yeah, you have to keep that in mind. Like they're showing you the best. <laughs> Even so, uh, my wife actually was following this gal on a uh, on Instagram, I guess, that apparently was insistent on showing like horrendous photos of her family. <laughs> so <it's> like, <laughs> That's a, a good lane. Train wreck. Yeah, I love it. it was great. So every <laughs> Sunday, she would she would be like trying to get her kids ready for church or something. Right. And it was yeah. just chaos. Right. <laughs> like a mess. This kid's crying, and the the hashtag would always be like Sundays are hard. Because <laughs> <laughs> yeah, then you get to church and you're like, hi, 
Like, yeah. You project this, like, perfect family. Yeah, you got your little, you know, boy with his button-up shirt yeah. and little tie-on and, like, mm-hmm. everyone's happy. But it is such a you, – you know what's interesting? The people that even try to make the train wreck posts. Like, you ever see those uh, short videos that are – it's, like, Navy SEALs training and they're, like, just getting the hell beat out of them. And, and then there's some motivational speech behind it. And, like, I, okay – <laughs> you know, the algorithm has really shown me who I am when, when I'm messing around with like yeah. Instagram or TikTok or something because mm-hmm. it's like, no, 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 this is what you like. And it's like, I don't like that. Yeah. They're like, yeah, you do. Yeah, you do. <laughs> yeah, you do. Yeah, you do. Yeah. You, you've watched 12 of these. Yeah. <laughs> and so one thing that I find pops up on my reel is, or excuse me, in my feed is – like weight loss videos. So somebody oh, who's like 400 pounds and uh-huh. then they have like some like dun, 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 like this mm. building music or like yeah. some speech like Jocko speech in the background and they're like in the yeah. gym working out and they're like losing this weight and I'm like like inner me is crying a little uh-huh. bit like get it yeah. man. Yeah. <laughs> and, yeah. and it's funny because even the darker aspects of or excuse me, not the darker, but the more real aspects of people's lives, which are like, look, we're all a little bit overweight. You know, like we all have the these images that we hate. Even those are kind of like weaponized from an entertainment standpoint where it's like you you catch somebody with like, look, I look like trash and now I look better. Mm-hmm. Right. So even that is this great success story when in reality, the majority of people that are overweight are not going through this like grand thing. So my dad actually is a bariatric surgeon. So mm-hmm. he does he does weight loss surgery on people that are like 400 pounds or 500 pounds. Mm-hmm. And I asked him a long time ago, I said, look, why don't people just, you know, like eat more cucumbers? Right. And things like yeah. that. He said, well, look, the people that I work with classically have yo-yoed in weight. So they've they've gone through many cycles where they're like 250 pounds, they'll go down to 150. But then they'll go to like 275 and they'll go to 180. And then they're like 350 and maybe they'll make it to like 225. But then they go to 350 plus and they never go back down. Yeah. And so the, the reality is most people who go through the cycle of losing weight, they bounce back up. A lot Almost of times anyway. Time. Yeah. You never yeah. see that part of the video. It's like Jocko's talking in the background and they drop yeah. to, you know, 175 and they're so happy and they snap these Instagram photos and then something traumatic happens in their life and people fall back into their standard standard dynamics and yeah. standard ways of living, which is, you know, obviously very upsetting. But it, it even – it's it's like everything's content now, yeah. right? And it's always content with a purpose. So even if you see – you know, dead leaves on a farm. Like then you start talking about bugs or the, or it's like not everything can be perfect and people – that resonates with people. And then even like you do candid shots and you're like it's kind of a train wreck and that becomes a thing. And it's yeah. like people just want stuff. Yeah, yeah. And they, yeah, the, the good stuff. But yeah, I, it, it, it – God, there's so many ways to go with it. But like yeah, it, it's – it's just hard to navigate and, yeah. and, and uh, like what angle you want to do stuff, you know, um, it, it, in terms of like, you, do you want to make it positive? Do you want to be like raw and like right. show people the problems and the issues with it? Because like, I think that isn't necessarily good either. You you probably want like a ratio like of like five to 10 good posts and then right. one about the struggles and um, and stuff. And, and maybe, or maybe you do the struggles with like a funny meme. Like I follow a bunch of farm meme accounts that are t- talk about like you know all the ones right now are about the august burnout for farmers and stuff and you know and it's nice to have that little like reminder but in a funny way right of like yeah it's really hard right now (laughs) there's an interesting mix you have to do like it's six parts right so you do one part funny one part trash one part educational Mm. one part motivational one part Mm, you you know like you you have this breakdown and it becomes very systematized, which is like this is the kind of stuff you have to do. And the, mm-hmm. the stuff I do on social media um, is is largely like, look, I sit down and whatever I'm thinking that day, I just do, mm-hmm. right? Like I'm not I'm not as organized. But again, I'm not also not nearly as successful as a lot of other people in it because, again, those people that curate the experience are really skilled with that. Um, yeah. Did you see uh, Did you see the social dilemma? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Mm-hmm. Okay. So the viewers are the product. Yeah. Like if We're you're not – okay. Yeah. Yeah. But – and that's very disgusting, right? Like you're yeah. instantly like, oh, God, that's horrible. Yeah. I don't want to be the problem. That's why like, they're harvesting our eyeballs. That's what it's like. They, right, they, but they, hasn't yeah. TV been doing that forever? Like mm-hmm. didn't that's TV annoying. deliver an audience to advertisers and stuff? Like mm-hmm. it's the same thing. You're mm-hmm. just doing it off your cell phone instead of watching some 50-inch flat screen. It's ramped up. Yeah, and I mean you think about that with, with news too, corporate media and stuff. Like they're – they're playing a game. They're, right. they, they, yeah, 
it's it's not necessarily they're not trying to necessarily get us in information they're trying to they're they're trying to get our they're making money and the way right. they do that is with ad dollar yeah so yeah you're right i think yeah, yeah that's a good point it's not it like m- perhaps social media isn't as uniquely evil <laughs> as as we as sometimes people say yeah, I would yeah. totally agree with that. Uniquely yeah. evil, like the lights flashing. Like, right, oh I know. God, watch out. We, <laughs> they're, they're coming they're for us. They're listening right now. They're coming for us. <laughs> Is it the corporations or the government? I guarantee both. it's both. Yeah. <laughs> they're one in the same, They're man. the same. <laughs> they're the same people. So, Here we go. Uh, you got into farming 10 years ago. How'd that happen? Uh, tw- I got X-12. Um, so 12. I graduated Boise State with a degree in business management. No background in farming. Like, I don't, yeah. Um, and I was reading at the time a lot of, like, Wendell Berry, like, America's, like, agrarian poet laureate uh michael pollan i was reading Omnibus he was a client of mine oh yeah he, he taught me Sweet. how to roast pigs no so way when, yeah so when i did the pig roast on fourth of july that's because in like 2010 michael pollan i was working with his son um for sat prep he invited oh. me to his house because they were doing an annual pig roast and they're like matt is an unrepentant carnivore i'm like hell yeah <laughs> I am. so they invite me over the night before when they're like okay we're starting the pig like this is how we're going to do the pig because he had done this whole bit going through the south learning how to pig roast all of the stuff mm-hmm. and he has a bunch of foodie friends right so they oh, course, did yeah. this pig roast so i got to hang out to like three in the morning you know oh m- measuring the temps and understanding mm-hmm. the concept and then i went home the next uh the next day and i was like i could build one of those so yeah. i built a custom pig smoker that functioned very similar to the way similarly to the way that michael pollan's worked um oh, anyway cool. so yeah you're you're reading pollan yeah I'm a, I'm a fan yeah awesome um and i i was just like i i decided what i want to do i i went into boise state like i i didn't know what i wanted to do so i stayed in town um and um, just got a good general degree. It's like, I can kind of decide where to go. Business is good, general. Yeah, right. And, um, and so as I'm, like, getting ready to graduate, like, well, what do I want to do? Um, I, I was working um, with uh, people with disabilities in the workforce of job coaching. And um, I, I knew I didn't really want to do that. I was getting kind of burnt out on that because I'd, I'd been doing that since, like, late high school. And um, I was like, I don't really want to go to social work. Um, I liked history and philosophy, but, like, I didn't really want to teach. And so I, as I'm reading these books, I was like, maybe I, like this local food movement seems super cool. Like, and I, I, I think I want to be more than just a consumer of it. I want to be on the producer end of something. And, um, and so I, I just started looking for um, places to intern. And there were two options that I wanted to do. Um, this is after I, got, I graduated in December 20, 2009. Gotcha. And so 2010, I apprenticed at a farm called Morning Owl Farm. And they had ducks and a veggie operation. And I, I wanted to do that one. Um, because I like the idea of like uh, integrating the fa- the animals with the you know the, they the ducks made amazing compost. There were about eighty to one hundred and twenty ducks at any one time. Were they harvesting uh, uh, duck eggs, eggs as well for eggs? Yeah, yeah. so yeah, duck egg production. What the the duck? Uh, there's one type of duck that creates the most eggs annually. Like it's not a chicken. If you want some kind of fowl oh, that's going to produce eggs, yeah, there's yeah. there's a type of duck that does something on average like two hundred thirty eggs per year. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, like if you're that's into, about what mine did. Yeah, um, but it, it was actually it, it, they they say a little less than a chicken, at least these ones. Yeah, yeah, because yeah, yeah, there are all yeah. different types of types right. of ducks and chicken, right. Obviously. But that's interesting. They're, so a duck yeah. is a certain They're, kind of duck is the most produced. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, and yeah. it's that's not yeah. to say that's the most favorable. Egg, right, it but, might be a smaller yeah, egg what, or and it may yeah. whatever the whatever the thing is. But the the point is that ducks are yeah. very very high producing um, as far yeah, as they're egg not bad. laying. Yeah, yeah and yeah. we don't think of them that way. Like we no. just think of a duck. Yeah. Like I like duck with a little orange sauce on it, but like mm-hmm. not or like I mean, the fat and stuff. But Dude, yeah, the fat is so good. It's, on it's a duck. amazing. Yeah, oh. it's anyway, so they were so doing uh, yeah. Th- these weren't meat birds. We did okay. you know if if one got injured or whatever or <laughs> ducks are super rapey. <laughs> 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 I don't know if you've ever um, so if, like there was an aggressive male usually oh, no. you, you kind of like to have a couple males because they, they kind of like it they'll pop it they'll have a literal harem like the same 10 girl ducks are always falling around a, yeah, a right. male um, but they, they can be aggressive sometimes so sometimes we'd have to like kill them or like I said one would get injured or they get old and you can just kind of tell like um, and so yeah, we have to put them down but we, we would eat them but it was just for us because they, they're not it wasn't great like meat because these were just bred for to be layer ducks so how uh, what a perfect 
kind of introduction to the realities of life. Yeah. It's like, oh, we had ducks and we grew yeah. these things. They're kind of rapey. Yeah. <laughs> like, you're and like, they are? The, you're the, like, yeah, yeah, they are. They are wild animals and mm-hmm. they are mean as shit. And just because they can, they're yeah. cute doesn't yeah. mean that they're awesome. Yeah. Like, the ducks don't know that they're cute. The ducks are like, the, <laughs> the dude yeah. ducks are out to get yeah. whatever the dude ducks want. Yeah, yeah. Um, and the, the other thing that I, I kind of learned about, about the ducks in particular is, um, you know, we always talk about like free range and like, uh, you know what? Birds don't really care for that as much. Um, so, uh, for example, like it, if you do like pasture raised poultry and stuff, mm-hmm. a lot of times they're under, they're in, like, if they're on like pasture, they're actually in cages still. And they just, they, they, they use these it. chicken tractors yeah. and they, and then you move basically the, the cage that goes over. And then they're on one square section of land for a little bit and then you move it and then that land recovers and you just kind of rotate around the past um but there's they you can observe their behavior they're so much happier when they're protected and covered because they're otherwise they're always like looking out and stuff and the ducks were always pretty skittish and for good reason we had lots of foxes we had lots of uh coyotes that were going on so it would it i and, and i would see like oh they're much more comfortable like in the barn so like the the, the whole like like uh they raised on pasture and they're happier animals like eh, there's some nuance there like <laughs> they're not necessarily happy just because they have open pasture like they're vulnerable yeah, in that yeah. way like every time like a big old like red tail would go over oh. they they would be like they, they, they get all quiet and like look up it was really funny to watch them. <laughs> yeah, like 120 ducks just go, what? <laughs> yeah, but again, so. that's that's human beings putting their own uh, proclivities and uh, yeah. preferences onto an actual animal. Like, did you ever see yeah. that? It was kind of sad. But did you ever see the uh, the social media uh, short f- film where this guy had, like, rescued a squirrel and, like, nursed the squirrel back to health? And he was, like, petting the squirrel. And this was, like, the releasing the squirrel back into the wild, right? And so it's, like, this little baby squirrel. And it's super cute. And you're like, yeah. oh, my God. God, yeah. that's it's amazing! So, yeah. Oh my God, it's a squirrel! Yeah. And the guy like puts the squirrel on the on the tree. He just like puts it there, and the squirrel's like, whoosh, like clings yeah. on. He's like, oh, go! He's like petting his tail. He's like, go, little guy! And the squirrel moves once, and it moves twice, and all of a sudden, this cat out of nowhere, like, oh, oh my God. and just jumps, and you hear this He's woman like, no. screaming in the back. She's like, no. I've seen it. Oh, yeah. and the cat is gone, and you hear it's this done. squirrel like screaming. Uh. And it's like, the cat doesn't know. Yeah. The cat doesn't care. And by the way, have you ever seen a baby squirrel? No, dude, they're hiding up in the trees yeah. with like, with their mom squirrel. Like, if they don't have some larger squirrel to take care of them, the baby squirrels are donezo, man. Yeah. Like, they have no capacity to hide and fend for themselves. And yeah. they're like, they oh, my gosh. They that, basically. Right. Yeah. Like, yeah. you should have let that squirrel go in the dead of night and, like, climbed up a tree and put it on a high branch so that no yeah. one and nothing saw it. But instead, you were like, here you go, squirrel. I'm going to put you on this tree, tree trunk and you're going to be so yeah. happy. Yeah. Anyway, so your ducks were terrified. <laughs> <laughs> Some, a lot of times. And, um, you know, a lot of people talk about ducks can be like a pet. Like, you know, chickens can be that way too. Right. And they come. But, like, once you have more than, I would say, like, 10, they're going to flock. And like I, I was always like, I feed you every day. Why are you so afraid of me? Because they just scatter. And like, wow. like it was. Uh, but they, they were a blast to raise. I love doing it. Um, if we ever get a chance to do um, some egg production here, which I'm, I'm hoping for, um, it, it's well into the future. Something like that. But um, uh, I, I love, I love a few ducks. Um, just because uh, chickens are awesome and fun. But uh, hat, duck egg is is pretty special. I actually don't like them for like the. the like regularly eating, but they're great for baking. Mm. Um, they're just, they're really rich and they're, oh, they're, they're quite a bit bigger. Um, but like bakers love them cause they just make stuff fluff up better. And, and Wait, and so they, if you yeah. just fry up two duck eggs, mm-hmm. it's going to taste a lot different than just two Not a lot eggs. different, but you'd be like, oh, this is, there's more. There's this, more going on here. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it, 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 I would say that it, it has more of everything. Um, uh, the, the good, the good stuff and, you know, more cholesterol too, but then they say it's like the good cholesterol, which who knows what any of that stuff means, <laughs> but yeah, no, super good, super healthy. Um, and, um, a lot of people who, um, are allergic to chicken eggs can do duck eggs because there's a different enzyme. Um, oh. and, and, and every once in a while there's like, oh, they, like somebody finds out they're allergic to duck eggs and not that they do chicken egg. And sometimes people are allergic to both. And so that it's an alternative for for them, and so it's nice to have it. It's a good niche market. Yeah, I was it was great. I, I, and again, that so the ducks were a big draw for me apprenticing at this farm, and so I got to learn that. Um, and then obviously the m- more of that thing was, was a veggie operation that was going on there, and um, so I apprenticed 
2010, um, I uh, worked there 2011, and then in 2012, I took over that operation. The Ducks went away for a little bit um, because I hadn't moved up there and I wasn't going to do any any animals without living on site. It's just too hard. Um, and so then I moved up there um, in uh, like spring of 2012. Mm. Um, got the veggie operation going for a couple of years and then brought, brought the ducks back for a little bit. Um, and, then, and then a coyote came in um, one night and got like all of them. It's like 80 ducks in one city. Yeah. Um, before that, it, 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 this was interesting too, it, it's just in terms of like um, predator aware ranching and stuff. Um, um, and I, I, this is the case with like, you know, a lot of people talk about the wolves and stuff, you know, getting cattle and stuff. I, domestic dogs kill more cattle, I think, than wolves. And that was, that was the case. Um, that was the case for us as well. Um, Dem- uh, like not d- feral, but like domesticated. D- d- yeah, they just got out. Or, uh, and they and, kill cattle. They, they can, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, um, and, and that's what happened with the ducks too. Uh, up until this coyote got it, the, our, our worst kill was um, a couple of neighborhood dogs that were in there. Came in and got like 20 at one time. Um, and uh, it, But before that, um, th- this was kind of interesting. Uh, the the ducks were getting taken like a coyote would take like one once a month or whatever and um, a lot of times a duck we would just find one dead in the in the barn sometimes and we'd put it out the back of the pasture to kind of as like an offering for the for the coyotes and like here take this one don't don't take the other one <laughs> um, and it, coyotes are weird and they'll take one and not, and not do anything um, but it, the, a neighbor got word that some of the some of the coyotes around were taking the ducks and so he started killing them. Um, and coyote, they're kind of territorial. Sometimes it can make it worse because, um, if they, if they have like, if their numbers are going down, they'll actually produce more, right. like, they'll have more litters more often and more in the litter. How that's the case. Like, cause like, I mean, coyotes are around not for lack of us trying to eradicate them through the last 200 years or whatever right. in this country we i mean they've tried right. <laughs> and it just you can't do it there's you know coyotes in new york city um uh so yeah coyote like, america that book uh, coyote outline, america, yeah yeah, yeah. So great they, that's such a good book yeah outline yeah. the the problem with like yeah. if uh if exterminating the, them is not no. yeah, yeah exterminating them doesn't work whereas with wolves you can uh you can trap one and then bring the others and they will and then you can trap the others mm-hmm. or kill the others do whatever you want but mm-hmm. coyotes were actually spread out so right. if they realize they're that's being different. exterminated they're going to yeah. have more kids and they're going to they're going to move to a broader broader area because they're not like this heroic kind of like you know wolf pack going to save one wolf they're like okay he's gone uh, mm-hmm. so we have to have like 12 more of us and, yeah. uh, and like let's switch up neighborhoods a little bit yeah so exterminating yeah, them it. actually actually exacerbates the population problem yeah it can yeah or in the or they just move out so right. um yeah and I, I love coyotes actually like I, I i like to call them the great american song dog <laughs> I did. I, 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 they're 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 a pretty special animal, I think. But um, so but they, they killed the ones in the area, one of these neighbors. And but what happened then is the foxes moved in, and foxes are way worse than coyotes because they'll come back and forth like four times a day um, from the den. So they, I was, we were, we started losing a lot more ducks, and then we finally we would find the the fox den and and take care of it. But like you, you know, I didn't like having to do that. So it was like it was a good lesson in like you trying to manage an ecosystem. It's, it's always trade offs in nature, and it's not always going to be to your benefit. And so like, um, it, it's better to do stuff with like chicken tractors and, and protecting them, and 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 maybe some fence stuff. But like. I mean, fences, like if you, the electric fence, like a fox or a coyote can jump over that stuff, no problem. Yeah, so right. It's, it's hard to know, or they'll dig under it. Um, so, it, yeah, it, it's just always an issue. You're just going to get some loss to it. But, yeah. And then what ultimately got them was a coyote got in there, and, you know, they get like, kind of like a domestic dog when they get into a rage. You can't yell at them and stuff. And it just, it went in and, like, kind of broke. It, it just took out them, took them all out. It was, it was horrific. But, it's, and, and the, you know, introducing it's tough, something to, uh, Oh, yeah, I'm sure. Because, like, you're, you know, we do take, as a ranch a farmer, like, we take on, like, the responsibility of that. Like, if we're getting stuff from them, like, you know, we have a responsibility to, like, do our best to protect them, but also balance that with, like, how much we're altering the ecosystem around us and all that stuff. So, yeah, I mean, it, it was it was tough. So stop the ducks after that. And that was that was I think uh, 2019. I was actually because I was still living up there when I started um, 
DCR farm. And um, I, so I was still doing duck eggs. Um, and and then it was late. I think it was like summer that year when that when that happened. But um, and I I haven't really I, I I miss the ducks, but I don't miss the work of doing it. It's like it's you can't go on vacation without like really setting up the it's because it's every it's at least twice, usually three times a day. You have to be doing stuff. Gosh, so, man. Yeah, yeah. Doing 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 animals is a is a different ball game than the veg. Yeah. Yeah, I Anyways, imagine. Yeah. Um, holding a holding an ecosystem in, in check when you're introducing something into it mm-hmm. and hoping that it's just going to work out. So, like, I, I obviously have never kept ducks, but um, I did have a big fish tank in college. <laughs> okay, so <laughs> fish tanks I, are interesting. I, I, I love them, right? Yeah. And I I got way into it for some reason. Like lightning must have struck me, but I'm like, oh mm-hmm. my god, I want a saltwater fish tank. This is Ooh, amazing. Saltwater, yeah. So uh, this guy who was on the rowing team with me, his girlfriend's dad had this fish tank store that went out of business. So he had like 40 fish tanks in his backyard because they had all the stock and they, I guess they were just holding on to them. So he gives me this fish tank very kindly. This is 80 gallon fish tank and it's, it's suited for salt water. So I get it all set up, but I'm broke, right? So I get the tank for free. And then he's like, all right, go to the hardware store, get this piece and this piece, and then you'll be all right. So I go to the hardware store, get all this stuff. And he's like, well, you know, the problem is you really need to set up a filter. And I'm like, well, how do I do that? And he's like, well, you can buy one for $400. So I'm like, okay, how else? And <laughs> yeah. I'm like, well, this is a set Essentially, what you have to have. You have to have this, and he showed me uh, essentially what the mechanism needed to be, which is suspending the stuff, this filter medium, in air over uh, a reservoir of water with like pumps going, and like you have, you have to distribute the water over the, this filter medium, like all this stuff, right? So I go to the hardware store, I'm like, all right, how in the hell am I getting? And I find this, uh, it was a wrapping paper. Uh, like Rubbermaid container. So it was really tall and it had this lid that also, so I flipped the lid upside down, put the medium in, got like a planter lid and drilled a bunch of holes in it. Had all this stuff, right? So like I made it actually work, which I was very proud of. So this fish tank was like my baby, right? And and so now I have the difficulty of actually populating the fish tank. Mm-hmm. Again, I know nothing about it. So mm-hmm. I go to the store and I'm like, okay, I have a fish tank now. It's mm-hmm. salt water. It's working. And like I do the whole seasoning thing, which takes about um, takes about six weeks. You have to put in these right. damselfish, which are mean sons of bitches, but they're mm-hmm. super hardy. So the damselfish go in, poop everywhere, and then the, the water becomes very toxic for fish. The damselfish, mm-hmm. again, are very tough though. So they can take this lower quality of water because what you need to do is grow the bacteria right. that eats all the waste and that has to grow in all the stuff in the tank so the damsel fish go in poop everywhere gets really toxic then the bacteria that eats the toxic sludge grows and then you have pristine water so that's after about six weeks so i go and i'm like okay here we go (laughs) right and i've been like saving up i've been Mm -hmm. eating top ramen you know and so like saving because each of these fish is like 20 bucks they're expensive yeah so i like get this fish and i get that fish and i get like a nemo fish because you know that's all i know i don't even know what's called a clownfish i'm like give me the nemo fish i'm an idiot 21 year old (laughs) so i start getting these fish and they're awesome to see but you realize really quickly like these fish are not wanting to be next to each other in this little tank so i had a puffer fish Mm -hmm. um spike which was awesome he was this little box puffer fish and these other fish and and they started nipping at spike's fins so they're pissed Mm -hmm. at spike and then spike goes and like crunches one of them because he's got this big old beak and he's like Mm -hmm. "Mm -hmm, you motherfucker (laughs) and like gets him (laughs) and and then i get these anemones that i'm like oh this will be awesome like i got a clownfish i'll get an anemone well the clownfish i had was not interested in the anemone for whatever reason like it swam kind of around it but it never hung out in it i was like go in the fucking thing like get in there like what are you doing (laughs) that's what you're supposed to do right And it's just like $50 an enemy. It's, I had to save it for like a month to get this right. thing. And then I get a, a, a Koran angelfish, which is only about this big, but they grow to be this big. And they're brilliant and they're beautiful. Like the angelfish are, are really something else. So I get this fish and I'm like really happy about it. I'm like, I got this little thing. <laughs> and after a couple of weeks, I see this thing on the bottom of the floor or a bottom of the tank on the floor. It's like this white speck. It's like this. I'm like, how is that? Did somebody like barf? What is that? And I'm like looking at it. And after about a day, I realized it's not a rock. I'm like, well, I gotta take it out. So like you get my little tweezer things mm-hmm. and get it out. And I'm looking, I'm like, what the hell is this? And I realize the anemone ate the Koran angelfish and crapped it out half digested. Wow. And I was like, son of a bitch. Yeah. But you realize yeah. like 
the tank is not interested in being your entertainment. Yeah. Like these are animals. Some of them eat each other. Some of them are, are solitary animals that aren't meant to be around each other. Like at, at one point I had a lionfish in there with some other stuff. And it's like they want to eat each other all day long. Yeah. And you're trying to manage this for fun. But it's not – like they're not interested in your goals, right? <laughs> yeah. So it's like when you're talking about having these ducks out there in this open, you know, in this cage, it's like the entire world wants to eat those ducks. <laughs> like you have the red-tailed yeah. hawk. You have the foxes. You have the coyotes. You have – I didn't even know domestic dogs were a yeah. thing. But like that makes perfect sense. Yeah. But you have this entire world that sees these fat little ducks running around in this little cage. You're like, they're right there. All I got to do is get through that cage and it's go time. Yeah. And the poor ducks are like – Jesus, man, don't you realize, like, this is the end. You have me on display. Like, this is terrible. Just chum in the water. Yeah. 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 And, I mean, we, we see that in, in much bigger um, settings, too. I mean, the, the Yellowstone ecosystem um, right. with the absence of wolves and then the reintroduction of wolves, like, really helped to – It a, a lot of articles about it um, maybe overstate some certain things. But, like, in general, like, yeah, the deer populations were exploding, so that was eroding the, the vegetation in the – uh, in the streams and because there were no predators they, they, they were hanging out more in meadows and so like it's just stuff was going the, the whole ecosystem was drying up because you need the plants and stuff to keep the rivers like like all this stuff um and then the reintroduction of wolves changed the behavior of of, of the deer it brought the populations down um and, and, it, and it really helped to re- revivify that that ecosystem so like we see it in uh, like humans always trying to um top down manage stuff um, uh, it, it, now we have a little bit more knowledge of, of those systems and how complex they are. And I think the, uh, the lesson there is like, it's not that it's complex. It's like uh, that we don't understand is like, it's more complex than we are even like maybe even capable of understanding. So like, um, yeah, it is, there's, it, so when we're doing our thing to raise food for ourselves or whatever, um, I think it's just something to like keep in mind. Like I said, predator aware ranching is like it's just like it's going to be part of what what we're doing here. We're going to expect some loss, and we're going to because of what we're our responsibility for what we're doing here. Like we're going to do our best to protect stuff, but like not to the detriment of of trying to top down manage an entire ecosystem. So, it's uh, veggies is kind yeah. of the same way too, just at a different a different level, different scale maybe. How do you mean? Um, so w- one of the things I love about farming and what kind of interested me is like I really like the 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 play of chaos and order and stuff. And um, obviously you go out to the farm. Uh, uh, there's some places that look really neat and tidy, and then other places that are like almost. I mean, sometimes the weeds can just take over places and stuff. Um, but it, it, like I, I'm using, it, it, we're, we're using nature, it, 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 like or like mimicking nature in a lot of ways. But it, it, we're always like, but nature isn't doing stuff in nice, neat rows. And um, yeah, we're diverse, but like you're never going to like have a monocrop of something uh, diverse in that like, you know, each bed has a different thing and I rotate crops and stuff. But um, yeah, uh, ju- there's just so much that we don't know or understand and that that comes down to the biology of the soil and the complex interrelationships of the mycelial networks underneath the soil and all, all this stuff is so cool um and and so chaotic but we're we're like kind of instituting some order to it and i just i, I love that that play of of, of trying to balance that because with how we're we're growing fruit for production so we have to have some order to do it with um you know <laughs> we're not gonna like just forage stuff and have it be like natural or whatever right. like the landscape and do. just hope That's that they can not, I mean, it, you're not gonna get a big fat cucumber if you just let everything yeah, take its or course or not irrigate like right. so like we're, we're obviously doing stuff like and managing stuff but like it's the degree to which we can step back and just let it do its thing as uh, having fostered some sort of order um but then remember that the chaos exists too and and to appreciate that so um i guess that's kind of what i mean that's kind of just like the philosophy that i kind of get off of with farming on that yeah. do, do you guys um manipulate crops or or plant them um 
it, with the intent. So, for instance, the like the Three Sisters uh, mm. classic story, right, where yeah. it's like Native Americans used corn, they used beans, and they used squash, right? So they grow mm. the corn, and then they grow beans alongside the corn because the beans could, you know, go The beans go, go up, yeah, and they also it, fix nitrogen. So yes, that's exactly. So that helps really. the corn, and then you have the squash that covers the ground at mm-hmm. the base of the beans and the corn, and that keeps weeds and whatnot out. So yeah. there are all kinds of benefits. Do you guys manipulate the your crop or your production to that level or is it more of like hey look you know we're going to rotate beds we're going to do a lot of different things but we are going to have a clear separation from crop to crop yeah there's more of a clear separation um those things are cool and i i really recommend it like for the home garden sure um and but it it's just it's, it's hard to manage in a high production market garden setting which is what this is so um I, I, we don't do that out there. Um, there. There might be some operations that, that come up in the future where we will focus on that. Like, but it, it, there is a, this idea of having like a, a raised bed area. Um, could even be associated with the new um, uh, clubhouse that's going in on the other side of the of the creek. Um, it, and it would it it'd be like a probably like a half acre, maybe even less than that. Um, like raised bed garden where people could like ha- have like a legitimate community garden space. Right. And then you, they go you, and participate. You rent out the box things, yeah. and I'd, I'd manage it. I do classes and stuff with it. Um, and then, you know, lots of people's food can come to that. And then it's a cool place for people to go just walk around, but it'd be like fenced in like, and real good, like pristine, like Martha Stewart garden, <laughs> like, you know, whereas like Martha you go out there, Stewart. Yeah, I mean, I, that, that's how I distinguish like the, the you can see this on Instagram too. You got the Martha yeah, Stewart garden people. Of course. And, I get it. It's, it's instantaneously like, understandable. It's like this yeah. beautiful thing. And like yeah. here you're talking about loosely managing the chaos of growing things. Cause I mean, you're yeah. dealing with life systems, right? You're dealing with crops that may not want to be next to each other. You have all these different things. You're trying to get a high yield out of it. Yeah. And then you have the person that gardens like a bonsai. It's like, it's like trimming a little exactly, leaf here and a yeah. little leaf here. Yeah. And, like, and you're like, look, just throw some dirt at it. Like, just yeah. It. <laughs> yeah. 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 So it, there, there's different styles to it yeah, right. uh, for sure. So yeah, I, I don't do any of the three sisters out there just because it's difficult. And like I lost, I, I was, I did like hundred pumpkins or something. I lost all of them. What, I got, what I got, happened? got them in late. Um, and the squash bugs were just horrendous this year and they just attacked it when it was young. And so it couldn't, um, get, if I had got them in closer to May, they might've survived because they would have grown up. And then when July hit and the squash bugs arrived, um, they might've been able to push through it, at least some of them. Um, but they were, I got them in like mid to late June and they were just these little plants, and they just they got attacked right away. Oh so, my gosh. yeah, and you know, there's so much that I, I that I do out there. Like there, it's triage, especially <laughs> early spring, and it's like I, I that's the last thing I get to. It's like if I get if we get pumpkins, great. If we don't, like it's fine. <laughs> like you know, right. we can get them elsewhere. Like it, it's it's not a big deal. I mean, um, let's but, face it, most people just use that food for fun. Yeah, yeah, right? yeah. It's and not it, like people. A yeah, lot of people I, are I making got, pumpkin I wanna, pie. I got to focus on the CSA. Yeah, yeah. Right. And, and so like, and it, they take up a lot of space for um, a lot of time. Right. And I, I I can't put that in the main part of the garden. So it's in the field next to us, which has so many goat heads in it. It's, it's I mean, what what goat heads. I don't know if you guys have ever seen it. So if you want to see what goat heads are, come out to the farm um, <laughs> and go to the field where I got some corn growing and melons and stuff. Um, you'll see it's not um, – it's the part that's not fenced in. It's acro- across the street from the main farm. And um, it, you, you'll see real quick where the uh, the goat heads are. And look down close because it is important to identify. You want to um, pull these out. Wait, what is a goat head? So a goat head is a plant that um, – there's one base and it sprawls out, okay. um, and it's green. It's got some purple in it, um, but it, it's got, it produces this goat head, and it, it it's a spiky seed oh. head that that I mean it it hurts. It's like you, like Legos. Yeah. On the, okay. <laughs> this is this is like a next level of that because it's 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 so sharp and pokey, and you'll see it 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 it, it keeps bike shops in business. Right. Um, and so watch for them on the trails um, and get to familiar with them. And if you start seeing them in your yard, pull it early. Um, and it, it, if um, if it has um, produced the goat head seed, those, those things can be 
viable for like 50 years in the soil and just wait for the right time. So if you have them, it's real hard to get rid of. Um, but but pop them out with like a hula hoe or something um, and, and just throw it away in the trash and try not to shake it and, and drop those goat heads because you're either going to – So I, there's other strategies for kind of mitigating them if anybody has an issue with them in their yard. Um, but, yeah, if you do see them, look them up. Just get a Google search on it and what they look like. Um, pull them out before they produce that seed head because otherwise you're just going to have hundreds more next year. You know, I I, uh, I tried to be a little uh, a little all natural with my lawn like mm-hmm. f- about five six years ago. I'm like, you know what? I'm not bagging this stuff. Like, yeah, I'm yeah. gonna just yeah. let it like thatch or mulch or whatever the hell it's called. I'm like, mm-hmm. I'm just gonna mow my lawn without a bag on it. I'm gonna let the clippings fall and it's gonna mm-hmm. increase you know biomass and all these things. And I'm like, yeah, this is a great idea. And I do it, and then after about two months of doing this, half of my lawn is covered in these horrendous weeds because mm. I didn't take into account that I was just redistributing the weeds and whatnot that yeah. that were in a small portion of my lawn, or I didn't even know were there. And they just pop them. So all of yeah. a sudden, I'm like, well, what do I do? Well, I'll tell you what you do. You start pulling weeds for like three weeks, right? Like you go yeah. out for like a half an hour a day, bend over, and just pull out these weeds. Because at some point, there's not there's not a circular ecosystem that we're like playing around with. At some point that you have to realize that if if you want to leave your grass the way, you know, it should be and you're like really keep – it's not going to look like grass after like six months. It's going to look yeah. like some crazy chaotic thing. And we're <clears throat> so – I think at least the average consumer is so used to having – in like one plant, right? And like this very neat, clean, pristine exchange of like, I water you, I put this fertilizer in, you grow and I'm happy. Mm -hmm. But in reality, you have like, for instance, goat heads that can last for 50 years. Yeah, Yeah. (laughs) just waiting. Just waiting. And they're going to be terrible and they're not desirable even in the least. It's not like, oh, this is like a natural native plant and it's going to be awesome. It's like, no, (laughs) if your dog steps on this, you're going to the vet. And if you run over it with your bike, that's a huge problem too. Like it's not – Farming has always seen, or did seem to me when I was younger, right? I think everybody's attempted to have a garden at some point. They're like, oh, it's going to be great. Like, we're going to grow food. Yeah, I didn't actually. That was funny. You did? I didn't even have garden grown up. Yeah. How dare you? Where did you grow up? <laughs> I know, right? Here, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt your story. No, no, no. Where'd but, you grow yeah. up? Um, I so I grew up here. Oh, nice. Um, I was born in Southern California though, which I love. To bring up, <laughs> I, I my my ritual with like new people in the neighborhood, and they're like, "Hey, we just moved in." It's like, "Oh yeah, where are you from?" Um, and and the, all of a sudden, it's like California, <laughs> and I was like, and then I go, "Me too," <laughs> and then and then it you know diffuses, yeah. So I like to do that ritual with people, but um, yeah, I was born in Simi Valley, California, um, in '85, uh, and then my parents got out of there in '94 after um, uh, riots, earthquake, fires, floods, you know. <laughs> And, um, so I, um, yeah, we, we moved up here then. So I, I grew, I was eight and I'm, so I moved up here. Um, or I grew, I grew up here, um, went to Centennial high school and then, um, like I said, didn't really know what I wanted to do. So stayed in town, um, to, to stay living at home and not pay for room and board to Boise state. And then, um, and then, yeah, um, so grew up here. Um, and that, but yeah, no, never had a garden or anything, lived in the suburbs, you know, um, and so, yeah, when I was getting into that agrarian um, reading and stuff uh, and just about food, it, it, it was kind of novel. And then I just immediately, when I just apprenticed on that farm with the ducks and the, and the produce and, um, and where it was located, which is the exact opposite end of town, uh, about a mile from the Highway 21 bridge, um, like going up towards it. So after Harris Ranch, um, uh, going out that way, it's in the, in the hills over there. Um, at the kind of base of Hammer Flat, which is a wildlife preserve out there. Um, pretty cool. So um, I, I just fell in love with the work and that location and, and everything. So um, I, that's how I got into farming. Like it wasn't like I, I, I didn't do, I didn't grow up doing this. I didn't even study it in school, which is also kind of funny. Like, I, I you know, most, uh, a lot of times uh, small farmers and regenerative farmers, you know, they have studied, you know, they went to school for, um not usually not ag stuff, but like, you know, at least biology plant, right. Plant stuff. But, um, yeah, so I didn't really have that education, which I think kind of helped because it did make me approach it from more of a business standpoint rather than, and I definitely had the romanticism of it. Um, and you know, I, I, again, I I love the work and I love plants and I love nature and all that stuff. So that all, it all kind of meshed together and ended up being kind of perfect for what I, 
um, what I'd studied and what my like kind of passions were too. But... Now, when you say you had the like romanticism, yeah, is this genuinely past tense? Like the oh, veil God. has been lifted, and you're like, <laughs> yeah. I get up at three in the morning every day. I, I think can. there's an issue with it actually, um, and and talking with like other um, other small farmers, um, it, it it's almost a limit. I'd, I, I went to a talk of an author who who came to, to chat here, and I, um, because she was an author, I, I but she also like managed a farm. I it, she had a book reading, it rediscovered books, and I, I went and I talked to her afterwards, and I brought up Wendell Berry when I was talking to her, and she goes, "Oh, Wendell, it's like if any of my interns ever come up and they mention Wendell Berry, I don't hire them." And I was like, "What?" I was like, yeah, it, it just it means they're coming at it from this romantic part, and I don't want to be, I, like, this is a business. I need even, and I brought up one because I, I I would it, writing is something I would like to cultivate, and I, I enjoy doing that sort of thing. Um, and at, for, for a time, I haven't done it in years, but I, I felt like I was half decent at it. So it's something that I'd like to it's cultivate. Like riding so a bike, man. I, you can I, always pick. I, it back I, up. I'll pick it back up. Yeah. Um, uh, and, and so I wanted to bring up Wendell Berry just in that sense of like, because she's an author and I was like, I bet she won't talk. But like she just, she went into this like kind of rant on <laughs> like the the kids coming to her that were coming, approaching it from this romantic thing. And then she's like, they always, they never last the season. <laughs> they they stop coming out. After They're like, what. this is not like, that entertaining. This is not what I want. So like, and you know, I think that's another issue with like the Instagram stuff is it it, it can look so appealing and just so rustic and great and like, but they're not seeing how like kind of rugged and, and hard the work is, and like, yeah. So, um, or that there's like big money behind it. I think that's the thing that it often gets overlooked. It's like, it, if like you don't have the money or access to land, like it's going to be a grind, and it's a job, and it's a biz small business, and most small businesses fail. Like what, seventy percent or something? Right. Um, oh, farm, I mean, yeah, farms I are exactly like... the same. Like, like it's a, like if you a new farmers trying to start a venture, it's about that same level. It's like seventy percent failure rate after two, three years. I think that would actually be a really, really successful business because I think it's like ninety five percent fail after the first five years. Okay. So the attrition right. rate for a small business is yeah. just, and some small businesses are silly. Like they have, you know, course, you have yeah. some idea about like what you're going to sell and. You know, you take a little bit of time to do it. Maybe you incorporate. But for instance, the average podcast lasts like seven episodes. Right. Right. Like the average person just is not going to be doing what what is required or has the wrong idea about what the experience will be. So what did Wendell Berry write about? Like what was this? Like I said, he's he's a lot of poetry, a lot of really – and – there's a lot of directions to go. So it's just it, it, very romantic about, like, uh, Jeffersonian, you know, the America being um, the, a, a land of the yeoman farmer, like uh, the self-sufficient. Um, and there, there's a lot of problems with that just in general. <laughs> but, um, it, yeah, there there is – and he, he got involved in, like, the 70s and 80s in the politics. Um, he wrote The Unsettling of America, and that was kind of about, like – um, I think stuff becoming more mechanized and consolidated and bigger farms and um, and everybody moving back to the city and being detached from ag. Right. Um, and, and and so that's that's kind of, I guess, if there is like a thesis of what I talk about with when I bring up Wendell Berry, it's like that, like going back to the land, if not in like actual physical, but like remembering like where your food comes from and um, and, and that that sort of thing um and re- remembering the hands that touch it and and the 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 earth that provides it um so it, it, that that's kind of what i was and it like amazing amazing poetry that isn't even always about like ag stuff um but um it, it, so i just i was i was into that kind of stuff at the time and so, Man, but it's it, i um, think that's such a obviously we're moving farther and farther away from that right like yeah. life is becoming f- more and more and more transactional i mean just yeah. th- think about it this way right when i was growing up we'd go to like a farmer's market N- not every single weekend but mm-hmm. frequently we'd go to farmer's markets and we get bread i remember there was this great farmer's market my mom lived in this big apartment building and um there was a giant parking lot right behind it and they would have a farmer's market there every weekend. So we would go yeah. down and I'd get these like monster loaves of bread. This was like our, our Saturday or Sunday thing, right? Mm-hmm. Like this 
giant thing of bread. And then there would be a farmer that had, like, cheese there, like, yeah. cheese guy. So come home and just, like, demolish this baguette. Like, we'd each get a baguette because it was, like, a dollar, right? So right. it's, like, this yeah. giant thing and cheese and you just go hard. And so we'd, like, sit there and, you know, just get fat and, <laughs> like, enjoy ourselves. <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, and that was a great – that was a fun experience, right? And we would get some produce and whatnot. I remember going to buy, uh, pick cherries when I was a kid too. Mm. Like we go to these – cherry farms and and peach farms and stuff and get get produce right so you're literally there right you're you're maybe i'm not in the oven but like i'm going to the guy who baked the bread and i'm getting the bread from him you know and then i was actually going to the cherry farm or the peach farm whatever and picking stuff right and that's the benefit of living in california you don't have to go too far to find like a cherry farm right but then you know obviously that that stopped Right after a while, and that parking lot got made into a Lenardi's and right. you know a grocery right. store, and and then you're buying food from there, right, mm. or, or wherever else, and you know the farmers markets became less and less about the actual farmer. In fact, there's there was still a farmers market in Danville, but we actually found out that a lot of the people that were actually peddling the produce weren't growing it; they were buying it from other people and then bringing it to the market in you know milk crates and it looked very fresh and awesome right. and everything but yeah, in reality these problem. people weren't even farmers yeah like yeah. the they, they were literally like brokers it's like a reggie's right? veggies in town yeah yeah, yeah some of it like might be good but they're mostly getting it from cisco right yeah. stuff yeah. like that so not only do was i not going to the farmer's market anymore but the farmer's market itself turned into just this transaction where it's like i'm going to get the food from over here and then i'm going to bring it to these people over here so mm-hmm. again you're just you're not even there anymore and now i'm kind of shocked because I'm actually not even going to the store much anymore, right? So, like, right. we have this additional separation of, you know, the – what's the – come on. Help me out here. The del- food delivery. Yeah. Uber what, Eats and there, stuff like there that. There you go. Yeah. 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 So it's not Uber Eats, but it's uh, Instacart. There we go. Insta- That's yeah, what yeah, I'm yeah. looking for. Okay. So now we're using Instacart. So now I'm even farther removed from the food, right? So yeah. it's like the farmer's, you know, growing it somewhere. I don't know where. Somewhere. Might not even be this country, right? Like, yeah. But they're growing it Probably somewhere. Probably Central Valley, California. Right. Yeah. You get California produce and then it's getting shipped here and then it's getting put on the store shelves and then somebody's going to the store to get it and then it just appears on my front door. So it's like my whole life has been this – you know, stripping away of actually, and again, yeah. I'm not in any way representing that I was like on the farm as a kid, but like yeah. I was meeting people who were, you know, baking bread and, and you know, uh, cultivating cheese and, you know, growing produce. And I very yeah. much enjoyed that. And now it's like I just tip somebody 10 bucks and it all appears right. at my at my right. doorstep. And it's it's like how how much farther can we strip this away? Yeah, you know, like we're, you can't get much more removed from the thing that you absolutely need for life, right? Like, there's right. no way of getting away with not having food. Yeah, yeah, and I, I think, I, like, I, I'm certainly not a purist, and I, I, I think there we ought to pay some lip service to how just amazing we have it, um, oh, yeah. and how grateful we we ought to be that we can get bananas and. February here and tomatoes in February here like you know um it, grocery stores are you know it, 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 it I heard a, a funny story of like um the people in uh that, that grew up in like communist Russia they they come here in their first time in a grocery store they like freak out yeah, they, they were like bananas. yelling through the and that's like all this abundance yeah. and like but for us that grew up with it it's just normal and you just go to the store for food now if kids you know grew up during covid it's like standard. Yeah, we get our groceries delivered. Like, and we right. do HelloFresh a couple times a week or whatever. Um, you know, that, uh, so it's like it's becoming much more normalized. So it's like we almost have to, which makes like the farm being here on site like that much more like novel and cool. I I think so. Uh, but yeah, we we have to work maybe a little bit harder to find it now. Right. Um, and um, and and people want it. So, like, th- that's why I think this, like, sort of model of, like, embedding a farm into a neighborhood um, could really take off. It, it, it really, it, it can, it, I mean, it adds so much value and character um, to community. And that's what we, that's what we want. That's why people are moving here. And I had a lot of people tell me that, like, the farm was kind of one of the selling points for them moving into DCR. And so right. uh, I always love hearing that. And, um, and, and yeah, I, th- I think it's, it, you know, right now, like, <laughs> there's a lot of aspects that are, that are funny and dirty and clunky at the moment. But, um, 
uh, yeah, I'm, I'm really excited for like the future of it and, and getting better at, at it and all that stuff. Um, but anyways, uh, yeah. Well, I think, I think the farm offers, um, you, you went to Boise State, you studied business yeah. management, right? And here you're a farmer, right? And obviously, I, I have to imagine that you use at least some degree of your business education to be a farmer successfully. So that's great, right? Mm-hmm. But there's, there's always the question of, what are we doing with our educations, right? Like I was speaking mm-hmm. with somebody just yesterday, um, Joy, it was a, she's a wonderful person. And she was an educator for a long time in, in California. And we were talking about education in general. And there's always an aspect of like, what are we teaching our kids, right? Because it's so difficult for, it's impossible for our children to see the correlation between what they're learning in high school and then what they're learning in, uh, or excuse me, what they're doing in the real world. Mm-hmm. As, as like a sixth grader, you're not, you're just not going to know what that correlation is. Right. But even for adults, a lot of times now, they're kind of like, look, I don't have a really good answer about like when you're ever going to use this particular thing. Like I just don't know when you're going to use it. Yeah. But growing things that you can consume is one of those first things that people say, oh, I need to do this. Because if I don't do this, then this won't work. Like, for instance, growing the pumpkins, right? Mm-hmm. When you were talking about this, it's there's so much nuance that goes into farming that people are like, I thought you just put the seed in the ground and, like, grew. Or, like, mm-hmm. you buy the plant that was once a seed. I don't know how it came from a seed to a plant. But I buy the plant. I put that in the ground and that grows. It's like, okay, there's a lot that goes on here. Like, there are bugs. They're like, oh, yeah, there are always bugs. They're like, no, no, no. But there are seasonal bugs. And there are mm-hmm. bugs that don't come on until, like, this time of this month. Or, like, the weather has to be hot enough. And blah, blah, blah. Right. And you have all of these things. So it's like, look, teaching a seven, seven-year-old or an eight-year-old how to effectively grow a pumpkin crop, there's so much that would go into it. And finally, it's like, if you want a pumpkin, you have to do these things. And that kid's going to walk away with, like, okay. I understand cause and effect now. Like, yeah. and if I want cucumbers, I have to do this. And then once they're successful, they get to go home and eat the cucumber. Like, this has a direct relationship to your existence yeah. instead of like, you know, this is how you find the circumference of a circle. Yeah. <laughs> Which I'm not yeah. against. Like, I love math. But it's very difficult to justify that to somebody who wants practical life application in everything that they're learning. Absolutely. Yeah, you, let me give you a solid here. Sorry, here I don't. You, oh, you, you have a beautiful <gasps> face. You I have, I couldn't see this. No, it's the fine. coaster. I, just, I didn't want I, my mom. Would I didn't be want horrified. the people to miss. You know your beautiful face. It's gonna <laughs> leave a ring. Listen, I want you to come in here with your dirtiest hands possible <laughs> oh, and just smash it on here <laughs> and then sign it underneath yeah. like Farmer Dan. <laughs> yeah. Farmer Dan's mess. Yeah. yeah. Did um, Did you have so, that kind of enjoyment once you first when you were, for instance, interning? Oh yeah. You were like, figuring it out. Oh shit. Yeah. Like I'm actually doing something. Now. Yeah. Well, one time, I, one of the first like lessons that I learned the hard way was like um so it, like well, we could weed this bed now or, or do it another day and the crew kind of decided to weed it another day um and sure enough we didn't get to it the rest of the week or the week after and by the time we got to it the weeds were so much bigger it would have been seriously like dragging a wire weeder through it at that the first time and then it turned into okay we have to pull by hand every single one of these now and so it was like you know, so there, there were lessons like that um but then there, you know what you were just saying that made me think of is like you know the old adage of you know teach a teach a man to fish yeah sure sure i think there's like i think there's a one after that it's like it it's not just uh teach a man to fish it's teach teach a man to te- um <laughs> how do i say it teach a man to be able to teach himself how to fish. So you need to know how to ask the right questions. Uh, and I think that is, that's the next level. So, and that might be finding somebody to like mentor you, like to find a good fisherman sure. to learn from directly. But like some people might not even know to do that. Um, but like you, you have to be able to like, that's the next level of like education is like you see a problem and you've figure like then you use what the tools you've learned to like figure out okay what do i like how do i even start to go about this what questions do i need to ask um and and um so it's it's a whole different way of like looking at the at the problem yeah, yeah. i a uh, man that it i've never heard it put that way i think that's such a beautiful and crucial piece i was speaking with my wife just yeah. literally two weeks ago and you know the there are a lot of things going on, and uh, people don't generally realize what goes into. For instance, making this episode, 
Right, right. People don't realize that it's going to take an entire day to put this whole thing together, right? It's not just a conversation and, you know, even the lighting in here. There are something like 13 different lights and they're all individually, you know, individually controlled. And there, there's a lot that goes on. I didn't even know how to use iMovies in 2020, right? Like I didn't understand right. how to even take a video with my phone and put it onto a computer until like – and manipulate it in any way until about like the beginning of 2021. And then I started figuring it out, right? And it was actually right at the end of 2020. I'm like, oh, I can figure this out. And people ask me, they're like, hey, could you do this project? Like, oh, yeah, sure. And then instantaneously, it's like Google how to do it. Right. But you, it, it's saying yes to things that you don't know how to do that forces you to either find the person who knows how to do it or learn it on your own. And it's learning it on your own, develop learning how to learn on your own opens up this like world of possibility for you that people otherwise you you'd be closed off from forever yeah. so yes it's not just like it would be great if we all had someone who knew what we needed to know and could sit down and just teach us and we were receptive and it just worked yeah. but more likely than not people that are successful like yourself right you're like look i don't know how to do this stuff i've never farmed i didn't grow up farming i didn't grow up gardening but I'm going to figure out what I need to figure out. And you find the people that know it or you learn it on your own. And that's how you make it through in the world. And if more people knew that, especially young people, then like it's unbelievable to think what, what we could come up with. Mm -hmm. Like you're just sitting here as like this untapped potential. But because you're waiting for someone to teach you how to fish, you know, it's like you just go hungry metaphorically, right? Yeah. And, yeah, I've never yeah. heard it put that way, but that's yeah, so, I always that's thought so there, there on needs point. to be a second one. Because, like, yeah, you can – it's kind of you, – you probably – yeah. I, I just – teach them – teach somebody. But I was like, you, you get, there's more to it than just, like, teaching them to fish. Like, they, you got to – and I, I, I guess I kind of just learned that, like, later on. Like, I, I, the, the students who did the best were asking more questions. Um. And so it, 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 on the surface, you might it, – it, it's a, a first pass of that. It's like, oh, well, they have a lot of questions, so they're not getting it. But no, it's the opposite. Like they, they know – they're figuring out the questions to ask to be able to – because like the one subject I was decent at but like not good um, was, was like math, like upper level college, like, you know, second year of calculus or whatever. Like I was just sitting there like – I, I was never asking anything. I just because I just kind of wasn't getting it. Like, and the the kids that were asking questions and like wanting to see something again, like they were the one. Even though, like, again, like the first path, like, they're, oh no, they're they're actually starting. It's coming together for them because they're asking questions. So right, when know, something starts co to come into focus, they've taught you, themselves what to do. Right, the, that's what. And you know, the first aspect of learning is when you start recognizing that there are things you don't know. That's so right. Good. Nobody wants to say that anymore. No. And until With you anything. until you've learned like a tiny bit, you don't know the depths of knowledge that you actually are lacking. Yep. Right? But like once you start learning yeah. something, that's when you're like, "Oh, I don't know any of this shit." Yeah. And then at least you you have an opportunity to start asking questions because you start recognizing it's like there are 100 things I don't know. Like I might as well ask one of them. But before you have that list of 100 things you don't know, you're kind of at a dead end because you're like, yeah. I don't even know. Yeah. Do, you, do, you ever, uh, do you ever play – again, the way you put this, um, knowing the right questions to ask. Whenever I have a problem, I go straight to the Google because the Google knows all, right? But it's knowing which question to ask yeah. and how to phrase it that's going to actually get you the like video on how to fix your garage door or like right. – and like do I put in the product name? Do I put in the product type? Like is it standing air conditioner or do I have to put in Toshiba air conditioner or like where is it that I have to put in the right question to get the answer that I'm not even sure about what I'm looking for, yeah. right? But it's knowing it's, – it's that dance with the Google, which is like, okay, mm -hmm. how do I rephrase this question? It's like, no, 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 that's too many words or like this is too short or it's bringing yeah, up things that are unrelated. It's getting me ads like – and you got to right. like look at the you know titles of the pages that are coming to like know what's going to – more likely to get you a, a better answer. Like yeah. there's a lot to it. It's an art. There's an art to Googling. But, it's be yeah. You're so right. There's an art to knowing how to ask the right yeah. questions of the world because the Google yeah. is essentially like the world's knowledge, right? And it's like, yeah. what do I want to ask of the world? Because the world will teach me anything. I just need to know what to ask, 
and like how to ask it. And then you go from there. And so it's like, you know, even when I was learning, uh, learning how to use iMovies, right? And I've mm-hmm. long since moved past. It was like the Google helped because you mm-hmm. have – Hours and hours, you have a lifetime of videos on how to use right. iMovies. And then you start and like you YouTube know, like understanding. Yeah. Yes, YouTube's yeah. beautiful and you start kind of understanding. And then, then the next step comes from like once you have your answer, you have to put that answer into action. Mm-hmm. Because no matter what, even if you have the best answers, like if you're not trying it and screwing it up, then you're never actually learning it. Because the things you learn have to be like these hard fought, like hard earned, hard earned successes. Man, yeah. it's bonkers. So yeah. Uh, yeah. L- let's go back. So you're you're interning. You have the ducks. You mm-hmm. lose the ducks, and or you lose twenty of them to these domestic. Dogs, yeah, that was that, that was good. I skipped all the middle. So yeah, I, right. I, but, I but end, like, yeah. How? When did you start? You said I think 2012. You started. You know That's the concept I, of DCR or what? No, um, no. So in 2012, okay. I um, I took over Morning Owl Farm. From the lady who had started it in, I think, 2004. She started with just like 30 raised beds and was doing like a 30-member CSA. Um, and then she expanded, added the ducks added, o- over the years. And then um, I, I kind of came in when she was starting to get a little bit burnt out on it. And she's one of those people that – it's awesome. Mary Rolfe is her name. Um, she was a teacher. Uh, it taught at Boise State and CWR for a while. And um, uh, it, it anyway, she it, it was a, a, the best sort of mentor to – to get and um uh she was like just done she just changes careers every 10 years type thing um and so i took over the farm i bought the the name and um started farm that moved up there on the property and um i was making a go of it um and uh so yeah from 2012 to um really 2019 because that's when the ducks went away um I i was doing that operation 2019 was also the year i started dcr um, and so in the, that time frame, in the, yeah, you're in that middle, managing this C and what's a CSA? Sorry, community? sorry, yeah, yeah, CSA community supported agriculture. Gotcha. Is what that, and most of the time, that's a bit of a misnomer. I think it's just a service. You just pay up front for the veggies that you get. This operation in DCR, I think, is legitimately community supported agriculture because some of your HOA fees go to the farm, like. It's community supported. It exists because uh, the, the this community has decided to have the farm as part of it. This as is an something they value yeah, and yeah. they they pay yeah. for it. Yeah, and um, so uh, yeah, but most of the time CSA is just a, a farm that you join up with. It's and they they kind of market as like you're taking on some of the risk, um, uh, but you're also getting the the uh, benefit of of a large bounty if there is one. Which, uh, honestly, that's the biggest complaint of CSAs is it's too much produce. Yeah. <laughs> like, nationally, you the... You can't keep up the con- with it. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah, sure. people don't cook at home a lot. Like, it's it's tough to do a CSA, to, to have a CSA. Like, it's okay. it's ends up being more work for you. But, like, because you're, it's just raw produce that you get. And you, a lot of times you don't know what's coming. Right. Here, with it, like, you don't... I don't even know sometimes until the day we start harvesting what's going to go in the bag so um you get an email monday night about what's coming the next day and then right. you have you know the next week to to get through it and if you don't like something a lot of times it just goes bad in the fridge and that's okay like it, it happens but um but, so, you, you, but like anyway you yeah, have to know how to deal with fresh produce like like for instance yeah, cucumbers come right I think, i'm yeah. like okay do we have red onions because i'm thinking like cucumber red onion cherry tomatoes you know mm-hmm. like throw it all together some balsamic salt vinegar olive oil yeah. like we're we're in business now like we yeah. got a great salad but you have to be really nimble i mean like mm-hmm. you and you have to like, oh we got bok choy thing. this week what do we do what right? are we gonna do with it? <laughs> right like who's steaming or frying bok choy like not yeah. uh, like man i actually really like bok choy i do too yeah yeah i'm a big <laughs> but fan that's a good example of like a lot of people don't and right. they've never used it before and, and they're literally know. like what the hell is this yeah right? yeah like looks like some kind of demented yep. asparagus like what what's going on here <laughs> <laughs> yeah i had the, i had yeah. this beautiful uh I always hated the fact that um, raised beds were straight rows, and of course you have to have like straight rows, right? Mm-hmm. And but uh, when I was when I was 24, I got I got my first house, and I was like, I'm putting garden bed in here, but I made it shaped like a G, so you could stand okay, yeah. in the middle yeah. and water everything without moving yeah. your feet. You could grab everything, and so like there's cool. this little entrance. Yeah, ex- exactly. And it was this redwood raised bed. I was like, this is gonna be awesome, and I grew bok choy like it was going out of style. Yeah. It was like bok choy. I even got a cauliflower, which I nice. I, I hear it's tough to do. Here. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So I had all this fresh stuff, but towards the end of the first season, I had these 
heirloom tomatoes that were like the size yeah. of like a, a softball on steroids, just rotting on the vine. Because I had had so, and this yeah. was a tiny little space. Mm-hmm. I had so much produce, and I was so like, I can't eat any more tomato ah. and cucumber. Because like these <laughs> cucumbers were just like making it rain. Yeah. Like, pfft, right. it go. And the tomatoes were like great, but I had like four tomato plants. Yeah. And it was it's a lot. Right. And it, for, for some reason, household. it was a great, um, yeah, it was just me and my wife. And it, we had this great crop, which was wonderful. But we couldn't consume it all. Mm. And then it was like I felt so horrible because it was like rotting on the vine. And then the next yeah. year I felt like so bad about killing the tomatoes that I like didn't grow tomatoes <laughs> again. And But you you do have to manage the the fact that you're going to have some attrition. Not You're not going to get through everything. Yeah, and you have okay. to be really nimble. Nature's abundant. Right. Like, yeah. And there's – there's so much waste in our current food system just because of the way we do it. But there's also waste. Waste. I don't. I don't think there's any waste in nature. Um, that tomato that was rotting on the vine goes back into the earth. It's okay. Right. Like you don't have to do every. Like I. That's a weird. I'm not sure where it comes from. It might be our like hyper um, that we have in our culture of like we need to be super efficient and. Like w- one of the myth- I, w- one thing I like to think about a lot is like other uh, cultures and ways of being and like you know it, it, there is sort of like the uh, myth of like the hunter gatherer that use par- the use part- everything use everything and it, Look, I sometimes like bone that, marrow. I sometimes bone that marrow was stuff. true but a lot of times they would kill a deer just because they needed the the hide from it they they might not have necessarily even ate the thing. And, like, at the time, it was super abundant. Like, it doesn't mean they, there wasn't respect for the animal or that life. But, like, it, it, it's actually, like, our industrial capitalism that's, like, what can we do with this part of the animal? And, like, in a way, that, that might be more ethical. Uh, one could make that argument that it's more ethical to try to use everything. You know, you make the bully stick. You know? Right. <laughs> that is something you would have just tossed away right. um, for a dog. And so you can market it. But, Bull puzzle. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but um, I used to work at Zamzo, so I did with a lot of it. Um, so, uh, it, it, yeah, it, it, there is this thing, like, we feel bad if we see that tomato rotting on the vine. But I, that's, I, I think, I, I'm not sure that comes from necessarily, like, a... It, uh, like we we moralize it uh, more than it needs to be. Like yeah, it's, but aren't it's okay. we yeah. aren't we grandchildren of like depression era people? That might be part of it too. Right, it's like, like it, you can't have any, ninety yeah. years ago. You know, I mean, yeah. like, could you imagine somebody just letting a tomato rot on the vine? It's like, damn, son, how goddamn loaded are you? Like, that's insane. Right, that's the height of luxury. <laughs> right, like you just we're we're so rich, we just lot, yeah. let food rot. And yeah. it, it, so, like, I get what you're saying, but I also think. We still let it okay. rot, but we just don't see it because it, it's getting cold in the field, right? Because it's not making it to the store shelf because that tomato wasn't perfect or whatever. So it just doesn't go into the system. So, like, we, yeah. we're just, we've just removed ourselves from that. I don't think there's less waste happening. Um, but it, we, we but, still but, feel yeah. bad about it. Like, that's the thing. When we what, see it, we feel bad. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Like, I, I don't think we're necessarily attempting to moralize nature because I agree with you. Like, nature doesn't care. Like, the tomato plant's going to grow. And it'll be good gonna, for the – Right. Yeah. Like, and be, by, because, by the way, the next season when I was growing after I had that, you know, mm-hmm. heirloom tomato, like, I had volunteer tomatoes. Right. Yeah. Right there like, oh, fuck, yeah, here we go. Oh, yeah. I'm, like, growing up. Yeah. And it was like, yeah. ah, tomato. And, and so I, I don't think we're necessarily attempting to moralize nature because you're right. Like the tree grows, it dies, like drops acorns and, you know, we all move on with our lives. But I do think that there are consequences to our actions where, you know, waste not, want not, right? Mm-hmm. That's a very clear kind of ethical guideline that that especially people who are descendants, you know, grandchildren of, of depression era individuals, it's like that was kind of ground into my, like I did not mm-hmm. grow up with a lot. I grew up with, you know, my family was kind of imploded. And I remember getting a paper route, um, a paper route when I was a kid because I really, I was like, I need a reliable source of money to buy food, mm-hmm. right? And and when I was in high school, I would very frequently buy, buy my own food. And again, I'm not complaining, but the point is, the idea that I would be so rich that I could just throw food away or yeah. purchase food and then be done with it. Then, yeah. It's like, like I have a hard time juicing celery. 
Because right. I'm like, how much yeah. of this am I wasting? <laughs> like, I happen to really enjoy celery juice. So I like, mm -hmm. I kind of squint and get on with it. Like, I feel bad yeah. buying Honeycrisp apples. But mm -hmm. like, I decided that as an adult, I'm like, you know what? I deserve to have a good apple once a day. Because mm -hmm. I was just, I can't handle the red, the brilliant red apple that's like one step above applesauce in like a loose skin. It's just, when you bite into it's it. Not, it's not. It's yeah. not. Like, that, like the gala apples. It's, it's like just... Oh, I can't take it. Anyway, yeah. so like I think when it comes to food, even though the majority of uh, lower socioeconomic Americans are actually overweight, I think when it comes to food in it's particular – another thing to like take a moment to just be like, that's kind of cool. Well, We live in a world where poor people – Have too much. Well, <laughs> I, I, yeah. That sounds – that's a really harsh way to put it, but like – that's, I mean, the, the alternative is they're starving. So, uh, right, I, I, it's kind of the same lip. Like, I want to pay a little bit of lip service to like how great we have it with the grocery stores and stuff. And like, let's remember that for half a second that this is amazing. <laughs> like, that it anyways, works. Anyways, no, I, no, no. I, I, I think it's just right. starting with a gratitude thing. I guess is is, is what I was getting at. With it. I think, I think the idea that we should we should like point. <laughs> get back to the land. Like the idea yeah. that's like we need to be natural again. It's like, have you ever been in nature? Like, yeah. that's not a great idea. Like, if you've ever tried to grow food that you can actually sustain yourself from. Like, I love the produce you guys deliver, right? But let's be real. It's not really, like, that calorically dense, right? Like, we need to start growing avocados. You need to go hard in root vegetables. Like, if you actually want to feed somebody through a winter, you better have a dump yeah. truck of potatoes and, like, a lot of other things. Because, like, the cucumber, as much as I love it, is not getting me to the finish line yeah. it, 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 when it's 20 degrees outside, yeah. right? And it, nor is it keeping. So the idea that it's like, oh, let's go back to the natural state of existence because that will inherently be better. No, it won't. Yeah. Like it's pretty awesome that we have a grocery store when it's yeah. 17 degrees outside. Yeah. Like it's pretty great that, like you were saying, we can get bananas in February. I, yeah. I have a, a dear friend who grew up in uh, East Germany and – he told me that they, when he was a kid, and he came from a very rough family and was living there, right? So it was like a double whammy. He, he in fact, had a paper route as well, mm -hmm. and he would get up at like 3.30. Because they didn't deliver the, the stacks of papers to individual houses, he actually had to go. They just dump them in one spot. So all of the delivery kids would, like, descend on the papers. And if he got there too late, there were no papers for him to, to deliver. So. Excuse me, my God, oh, those have so much air. In they do. I mean, they hit hard too. I, I always call them the Mormon Coors Light because it's like <laughs> it's almost water. <laughs> yeah, but anyway, so I, I, God bless him. Anyway, so he he remembered. He was telling me he was like when there yeah. were bananas, we would wait in line all day to get yeah. like four bananas because yeah. we just never seen bananas and you couldn't get bananas. So I greatly appreciate your perspective which is like look let's start with gratitude and say yeah. how incredible this entire system is yeah. and then let's the say that right <laughs> right like yeah. look at these lights yeah. like it's ridiculous but then let's say hey it's great that we also have the luxury to have you know a csa mm -hmm. you know the 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 agriculture and the ability, the the land to to grow this stuff and have kids participate in it and and have the lessons learned that you know we're I think we both appreciate, which is yeah. like you've made something, you did something that like can affect the world, like you made yeah. the cucumber or something. It's a yeah. man, it's a different type of it's a different type of thing. Yeah, yeah, and it's not like yeah, there we don't I don't. A lot of people start with a grand vision, like we need to feed ourselves, like that. And I, but no, I like these operations. Like I'm, we're supplementing the grocery store every week. We're not. It's not like you're getting all the food that you eat from the CSA, right? Like, especially this year. Like it, I've had a bunch of losses. The bags are not as packed as I like to make them, and so it's it's been a tough year. And going into the fall, they'll also be kind of smaller bags and kind of what I like. But be besides like, the pumpkins, if I may ask, what what did you have? Um, lots in? of loss in the on beets. I, I I'm battling voles really bad at them. voles is like a, is a mouse yeah um yeah and they just they go, they'll go through and they're doing it to the carrots too just go through and eat the tops of them and you know a lot of them make it into the bags and like you might even notice them if <laughs> you, you'll see like those little bites of out of the top um that we just miss when we're like you know processing and stuff i got a crew of about four people that, that we hired hands and um good awesome farmers and um and um yeah, but sometimes we just miss it or we're just like, yeah, that's not that big of a bite. <laughs> yeah. 
Um, so it, 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 it's yeah, and it's organic. And so I'm obviously not gonna put poison out. I don't want to yeah, get right. there. I got a bunch of like hawks and eagles out there that are eating the mice. Uh, so yeah, not poisoning. I'm doing a lot of trapping just with mouse traps, but like that only works to you can only mitigate them. But so lots of losses there. Um, some it, it, and just some other just kind of issues that, that were happening with the crop. It was a weird spring. Lost a lot. That went to seed right away after it was a very slow start and just didn't get to in time because of like weird timings on the with the weather. It made the crops kind of grow at w- different uh, differently than what they usually do. Um, do you normally anyways. get like a double spring? Because we had, we kind of like, things kind of warmed up at like the that. end of March and yeah. the beginning of April. And then all of a sudden, yeah. like snow again. It's always, I always post a meme. It's like, yes, we've had one winter, but what about second winter? <laughs> um, you so, kinda, yeah. you kind of have a hobbit thing going yeah, on. Yeah. I, 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 I what about second breakfast? Try, try to, I try to lean into that. <laughs> yeah. I'm your resident hobbit. <sighs> God bless you, <laughs> sir. God, that's great. Did you did you enjoy those uh, those books? Did you ever read them? Read the books. I saw that, started seeing the movies first as they were coming out. It was like timed it perfectly. Return of the King came out my senior year of high school, and um, so it was just like the perfect time to like be getting into that. And so like I didn't. I wanted to find out what happened. Uh, so I, I read the books like. After seeing the second one, I was like, okay, I want to, I should read it. And it, 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 there's a lot of poetry and like song stuff. And I was like, this is weird. <laughs> yeah, right. But, um, yeah, um, but I, I, know I, read, but I read, still read the whole thing. Um, and then I stopped at like where Return of the King would start. And then I just, so I got to see it. And then I was, so I did it the opposite of what most people do. And, you know, obviously there's issues with the movies, but God, they, they got to be some of the best. I, yeah. I, I think I, I think I finally made the decision that I like them more than Star Wars in terms of like some, like I can, we, my family, we can always put those on in the, in the background, and like we enjoy them. Like they're just they, they're they really hold up. <laughs> they I think. Hold up. Um, so you uh, yeah, and if if somebody says like, what's your favorite like trilogy like or like world like you know Harry Potter, or, like, it, I think Lord of the Rings kind of wins it. Those Lord movies are just Rings, so well yeah. done. I don't the, know. the last one, Return of the King, though, really. Uh, okay, my my issue with um, the Last Jedi. Okay, so uh, I don't even acknowledge episodes one, two, and three. You're like <laughs> a phantom menace. I know. You are Although, a phantom movie to me. I don't pay I wanted to, to talk all. to you about this. I will not let you debase Natalie Portman like you did. Come on. on. Natalie, name a movie <laughs> that you love Natalie Portman in. V for Vendetta. What's that? V for Vendetta. Oh, okay. Name the second movie. Okay. <laughs> Wasn't she, she in Black the, Swan? What's the what? Yeah, what? What's the um, movie with the guy from Scrubs? That was a game changer. Garden State. Garden State. Garden was State. She was I great remember that movie. She Good was luck our generation's with the manic. Abyss. Yeah, manic pixie dream girl. Like she. Was, yeah. Anyway, I was just. I'm. I'm joking. I'm not gonna die on this Natalie Portman Hill. But I just. I, <laughs> I heard that. I was like, hey, hey, wait. <laughs> I remember Garden State. That was a. That was a good movie. That I was, was actually thinking film. about that like yeah. last week. Yeah. Um, because the, I mean, obviously, I think his his journey out of like this medicated existence back into the real world, I think paralleled. I was thinking, again thinking about this last week. I think paralleled a lot of people kind of coming back into the sunlight after COVID, where it's like mm. you've been in this really kind of medicated, not even necessarily with alcohol or drugs, but just this crisis thing where you're getting this constant drip of crisis going through your brain, and then all of a sudden it's like, hey, step into the light. Like, come back to the world, right? And, of course, we all carry around our own traumas and whatnot. And, you know, the, the crux of that movie came when the when the dad, he's talking to his dad, and he's, he's like, you know, we need to get out of this. And the dad's, dad says, well, can you forgive yourself for what you did? And he's like, yeah. And, like, let's just be here now. Mm-hmm. Like, you're, you have been living and I have been living in the past, you know, when his mom died. And... And he's like, we need to live here now because yes, That's as so horrible important. as all of this was, yeah. there's there's a there's another chapter of our lives. But yeah. we, we're not going to be there if I'm horrified of the pain I'll feel, so I medicate myself. And you're horrified of like me realizing how terrible things were. It's like yeah. it's a very intense movie. Anyway, it is. So, <laughs> yeah, and uh, yeah, I hadn't made the COVID connection. That's really good. Yeah, I think that's important. yeah. So Natalie, anyway, Natalie Portman. Sorry. I think you're good. Um, what was the other movie? Oh, Black Swan. I found Black Swan to be like another parent-child thing where it was just 
so damn intense. I remember seeing that film with my wife and the the scene close to the end when she busts into the room and all of the uh, all of the pieces of art that her mom had made are like screaming at her and crying and she's freaking out. Like what a like bonkers movie, man. Like just yeah. Anyway, so Natalie yeah. Portman's fine. The Phantom Menace. The, uh, those horrible. films were like, terrible. But George and, Lucas and like I mean yeah he could never write dialogue. Like, if you go back to the original trilogy. Yeah, he's not going to like, Tarantino. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and not. And it just got so cartoony and stuff. And um, but, Yeah, so, yeah, okay, yeah. but, uh, so the next, the, the last three, seven, eight, mm-hmm. nine. Okay, eight, The I, Last Jedi. Better opinion of that, yep. Here's the problem that I had with eight. Okay, eight was, a, it was an issue because it's, the entire movie was this, like, crisis, Right, and, and you start out with like the bombing run and Poe is trying to get in, and then they're trying to escape, and then they find them in hyperspace, and you know they track them anyway, and then they they send out the the you know escape pods, and then she turns the thing around and blasts it through, and it's like first off, if you could go into hyperspace and blow up a star destroyer, why weren't you sending like suicide jugger, uh, juggernauts like through star destroyers all the time? Mm. Like that's the play, right? Obviously, you have a bullet going light speed, like yeah. turn them all around anyway the point is that was kind of my issue with return of the king so return of the Mm. king starts out with like the great battle scene but then it's like battle scene after battle scene and you think you ever you think they're gonna win and then you realize they're gonna die because you know the night kings come down and and then it's like you get saved by um by not Gondor, but the, the horse guys, mm-hmm. they come in and then wrong. that guy's yeah, exactly wrong. And and they're gonna die, but and then it's like then they survive somehow. And then they still have to ma- march to Gondor. Or, or excuse me, Mordor. It's like it's just too much, right? So like halfway through that fight scene, it's, it's been going on for forty five minutes. And you're like I'm tired. Can we get like an intermission? Like, can you just right. warm up it to it? It probably should bit? have been four movies. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Because the last they originally thing... were gonna do two movies, and then the producer they they kind of you know do the treatments and stuff and sure. talk about it and and it, it fortunately one of the executives were like this feels like three movies and this was before like trilogies were like everything was a trilogy right um, and uh, certainly before like Marvel and their right. huge movie arcs and stuff. Um, but it, it, I, an executive went like, "No, this isn't. This is three movies." And right. So, but it definitely could have been four. Yeah. Right, yeah. man. The scene in, in uh, it's like a half an hour ending too. Like you think it's going to yeah. end. There's like four different endings, right? Yeah. Oh my god! And they're playing that chick. I can't remember who that that um, singer was. The when she's talking about like the veil when Frodo's oh, going right. off, I was like crying. Oh, like, yeah. it's the I end. <laughs> yeah, know. but in the in the end of the second movie, when there's the there's the Battle of Helm's Deep, right? right. And uh, that's the first big movie, dude. Uh, th- okay. There is a scene in Game of Thrones when the uh, when the Hound and the girl, um, come on, what's the what's the small girl's name? Oh, Arya. Arya. So uh, the Hound and Arya stumble onto this farm, and it's like a dude and his daughter, and they they like yeah. welcome them in. They have this like you know rabbit stew, and mm-hmm. Arya and the Hound are like <laughs> like stick their faces in, and the guy's like, oh. and he robs them. Mm-hmm. Right, the hound robs him because uh, the hound is obviously this like hugely morally conflicted character, and he's like they're not going to survive the winter. They see them in a later season when the hound has come back with you know the guy with the flaming sword, and they see them and he's like oh you knew them he's like not really and that the dad and the daughter were in winter and yeah. the dad realized that they were all, both going to die and so he pierces his daughter's lung and like holds her as she dies and then mm-hmm. he he kills himself too super dark yeah but you see that representation too in the helm's deep battle when the the children and the and the wives and moms are in are barricaded into the thing and they're handing mm-hmm. out these knives and the, like i was pretty young I don't remember, even remember that they were doing oh, was this oh, in the book yeah. in the book or no 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 this was in depicted the in the film yeah really i don't remember the knives but yeah it yeah. it was a dark it was it was a brief scene but okay like again i think i was like 21 when i saw that movie so like you know i had seen terminator and stuff so you see violent right. things and like lethal weapon and but whatnot. never like hey if they're at the gates you guys have to start doing this <laughs> right yeah right I, there's a there's an aspect of that that just rings so painfully true. Now, I don't know if you're a dad, but it's like it's so hard to see that kind of stuff depicted. Yeah. And, it, you know, again, coming back to your gratitude, like we don't have to worry about that. Yeah. Or at least not now. 
Yeah. Right. Like, and that was a reality for people at, at some point. Like you talk about famine. And you, yeah. it's like people in Ireland, people in Russia, people in Ukraine, like people starving to death historically, like people are just yeah. dying. And you have to make this decision about like, what are you going to do with your kids? The, yeah. the the things you care about the most, if the worst is to befall you. Jesus, man. Yeah. This turned dark. This real got fast. real dark, man. <laughs> Yeah, and if you remember, the hound knew it. He he was like, he told Ari as they were leaving, like, they, they won't last the winter. They like, won't last the winter, was, yes. He was super cold about it. He was just, he knew, he could see, like, oh, they're, they're Because she was, Ari so was mad well that he this. robbed him. Yeah. yeah. He's, He's like, like, they won't last. Yeah. And it was just cold calculated, like, I'm just going to take this because they're not going to, yeah. Yeah. The hound was one hell of a character. He was man. such a good, I, I his story arc was one of my favorites in that, I think, yeah. What do you think, what do you think about Brianna Toth? I liked I liked her character. I loved her. Yeah, yeah. God, man. The I like her and Jamie. Like, yeah, that, that was so cool. Oh yeah. God, man. And obviously, the comic relief of the the red headed beard guy yeah. always trying to flirt on with her. But yeah, no, she was great. Like uh, the <laughs> epitome of like beard guy. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> he always had the crazy <laughs> eyes like at her. <laughs> she was just like. <laughs> It was so good. That was so great. Yeah. That guy was wonderful. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Um, but she yeah. I she was the like epitome of like what loyalty means. Like and even though her loyalty shifted, whoever she was loyal to, like, she was a hundred percent all in for that person. That was like uh, right, and I appreciated that about her character. But I thought I thought that was one of the reasons why the author put her and Jamie together because Jamie of course was this um guard right one of the members of the white cloaks that was guarding the king but he he was so painfully aware there's that scene when they're they're uh, getting into a bath right like the giant bath and she's in the bath she's like oh my gosh she's very modest and he's like oh just relax and he's like <laughs> yeah. getting in and and he has this breakdown he's like because you they make you swear yeah. allegiance to like protecting the weak, but like which weak? Not the weak that you're killing, only the weak that they deem. And like the king can kill the weak, but like you can't kill the king and the king, like all these different things. So he's the epitome of, of principal conflict, right? Because he, right. he, he recognized that any number of principles at any time are directly in conflict with each other, but you're supposed to be this steadfast, loyal person. And so then you have Brianna But Toth maybe not here. always. Yeah. Yes, yeah. not always. Like, loyal to who? Yeah. Which rules do you follow? And then yeah. you have Brianna of Toth that's trying to be, you know, she was obviously portrayed as this highly competent but extremely naive mm -hmm. individual who's like, I want to be loyal to someone. And he's like, but what does that even mean? And they have these great dialogues yeah. and conflicts as they're journeying together. Yeah. Man, that is I'm the getting thing. fired yeah. up. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> did, did you read all of those books as well? I have not read those books oh. at all. Oh, they're I know. great. Well, and then the last season ruined it for me. I was like, gosh darn it. What? I, the last season Why? of Game of Thrones? Are you that kidding? The last okay. couple episodes? Okay. How did you see this working out? <laughs> I guess I didn't. Like, Arya kills the Night King. God bless America for that. You <laughs> that know? was the last, like, I, I mean, that was great. Of the, course. The Everybody's bastard jumping of up Bolton in their seat. gets eaten by his own dogs. God bless that. Right? Like, what? Yeah. what I, it was really just the last episode, I guess. It's like that. the way that is just portrayed i guess and like what they had happened i just i i i i, I thought this was like well known i thought i don't think anybody i didn't think anybody liked it you liked it the okay, way but the i way also the don't like ended. natalie portman so i okay. guess we're not at the same flavor <laughs> <laughs> okay look, we're just not going to agree <laughs> i i thought that okay so john snow was kind of like frodo he had experienced too much he, yeah there was no way he could be in the world mm -hmm. right like he had to go he had to go away the dragon Obviously, nobody could wield and had to leave. Mm -hmm. You knew Daenerys had to die, mm -hmm. right? Bran the Broken, of course, had the knowledge of the world. And so he had to become an integral part of the leadership. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Peter Dinklage, of course, he, he couldn't was like stick around. Like, yeah. he had, like, but he, he stuck, he, the great humbling line when he was. And it was like, he needs to be the hand. And the guys, the the soldiers were like, the unsullied were like, no, he needs to die. He killed, you know, like he's a traitor. 
And Bran was advocating for him to be the hand of the king. And they're like, you can't. And, and he himself, Peter Dinklage, is like, I can't. I thought I knew something, and I didn't. So you have mm-hmm. this great reckoning with his arrogance as a, yeah. as a younger person and then recognizing how limited he is in his own ability to, to make good decisions. And the weight of his decisions has finally fallen on him. And he's like, I am ill-equipped. Like, I can't. Because I'm not smart enough and I see mm-hmm. how not smart enough I am now and I can't be responsible. He's like, this is the burden then. Yeah. This is your punishment. Yeah. You have to do the thing that nobody in their right minds would do, which is make decisions for people knowing how poorly equipped you are to make the right decision. Yeah. Right? Like I thought that was just such so a beautiful – So that's good. <laughs> the in- individually is good. I-, I guess it was just the execution. And th- I felt like they had to – again, it should have been another season – <laughs> oh, and like you, you wanted it to be I loved, spread out. I loved how slow that first season is. Right. And you're like, it'd take the, like, they, it, suddenly they're able to, like, go from, um, like, go all the way across Westeros in, like, half an episode. And it's like, but yeah. they used to be, like, a month long, month long journey. And, like, and so it just, everything got condensed and, like, it, it got put together quickly. It's like a bunch of writers left or something and they just, like, it just it it didn't land like I wanted it to, so it's just execution about it. But like I agree with you, where everybody ended up, I did like that. Arya, it was like I'm going to go find out what's beyond Westeros, you know. Right. And that it's exact that's exactly what her character would do. So like right. I think they did keep to the characters and what needed to happen. I just the execution with how amazing it was up until the last season. Yeah. Was. I, I that's I, my I guess that's what I was. I do I, I do agree with you on that. Like they did move. And they, 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 like they went moved from the, the wall all the way down, in, like instantaneously. Like yeah. the zombies were coming, and it was like all yeah. over. And you know, Daenerys is there, and like it's. Yeah. Yeah. What did you think about cool. her? Um, like, you kind of knew Daenerys was half good, half bad. Mm-hmm. What did you think about? There was that scene in the third Star Wars where, you know, Anakin finally becomes Darth Vader. Okay, and you know the horrible and the soon-to-be emperor guy convinces him that he's like, "Hey, I can save your lady, you know, that you're in love with using the dark side. You just have to go kill all these kids, right?" And there yeah. was the, there was an aspect of that where it's like, "Wait, why did he kill the kids? Yeah. Right? Like, why can't you just save her anyway? Right? Like, yeah. let's go ahead and do that. Like, let's start with bringing her back to life, yeah. and then we'll hold off on the kids, right? Like, let's." You know. So there was an aspect of that transition where I was like, I don't, I don't get it. Yeah. Like it still doesn't make sense. He to went me. from, uh, well, what have I done when he right. kills uh, uh, Mace Windu? Right. To kneeling like two minutes later. <laughs> right. It's so, like I think you'd be a little more calm, but maybe I, I guess if I'm being my most charitable, that's when he just becomes completely consumed by the dark side. But even the dark side doesn't kill everyone. Like they still kill people with a purpose. That's true. Yeah. Right. So anyway, my, my point is that transition but was me. kind of out there. Daenerys flipping the switch yeah. from like measured and calculating to yeah. everyone's going to die. Like, did you? <laughs> right. Right. It's you, like, where is that? that? Like, she was more conflicted for right. so like, yeah. yeah. <laughs> One second. We're, we're totally good. Do you have work today? I always have work. God bless you, sir. I, just, I love I, so I love appreciate this. I you being yeah. here. I just yeah. want you to know, like... How great. I, I I mean, like, you got and cucumbers so, growing. If you're still here, <laughs> thank you for... If you're still here. Uh, enjoy. I hope you're enjoying the nerd. I hope people... Yeah, great. right. Yeah. I had no idea you were such a book lover. That's fantastic. I, God, I don't read all that much. I, 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 so I am pretty busy. I, 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 get it, I get a few months off in the winter, but then it you know, starts up pretty good. But What so, do you do with your off time? Um, besides, just, like, sleep and wash your hands? Family stuff. So we, I, um, I have family. Uh, a girl just turned 12. Oh, congratulations. And um, got another girl um, this past December. So timed that right. So I still had a month before I kind of really got going on the front. I, I start seeding things end of January. Um, and, you know, so December, January, I, I'm doing a lot of planning and, and stuff. And um, for this next year, going to be having a much more – one thing I haven't done much of, I, like I've just kind of – <laughs> I, I, <laughs> we should go back and like I, I do a little bit more history, but like yeah, sure. I did want this to be a, a, a production market farm that could um, be run on its own. I didn't want to um, 
uh, rely on volunteers to have mm-hmm. it. I think it's a big problem in the local ag movement is we uh, really rely on unpaid interns. And, and this operation doesn't need to do that. I don't want to do it. So, like, my main help, I do pay $20 an hour. Like, I want to pay a living wage what people deserve. Um, and I'm able to do that. And that um, just so the, the, the money that you spend on the farm goes to that. It's, it's paying us. Um, do good for uh, you guys. And, that's great. Uh, yeah. Because the uh, whole like, oh my gosh, this is a community yeah. thing and you got to come out if you're in the community right. or none of it works. Definitely like... didn't want to do that. Um, and I, I've seen time and time again, like community gardens where it really is just like the self-organizing, like getting plots and stuff. They just look like crap, especially this time of year. Nobody's coming out. Everybody's going on vacation. It doesn't get watered. doesn't get harvested. Um, so that's, uh, yeah, it, it's, I wanted it to be a, a good functioning market garden um, just on its own. Um, and so I have not been very good about, about like, the volunteer days. Uh, we've done a few. We had a potato planting last year. Decided not to do potatoes again because they were just such a mess. They didn't do well in the field. The, we have really hard compact soil with a lot of clay. They were really hard to clean. Um so just I know people for the one I don't potatoes here, but it's one of those that really you kind of need the right soil, and it definitely is better to do it mechanically. They're in the ground for a long time, take up a lot of space. Where, you know, lettuce mix uh, a lot faster sure. to go and flip a bed within you know a, a couple months. So, um, anyway, so I have not been good at, about the volunteer days, about classes and stuff like that. So I really want to get better at that next year. I'll put out a schedule in the um in the winter for for spring we'll do a couple classes probably a lawn class and so i for the the, after i took over morning owl farm i was always doing it like it it was more of a hobby farm Uh, i wasn't making all my income from it i I had a job at zamzo's that i was working at least over 30 hours so i keep health insurance and all that stuff so i always had like other stuff going on but um it's given me a lot of like knowledge so i can i feel comfortable doing classes and um and talking to people about law and stuff. So we'll probably do stuff like that um, and, and get more organized on volunteer days. Right now, it's just like Tuesdays come out. Um, usually I have a couple of people um, come out. They're awesome. They, um, they're they bringing their kids, and it, it, it's it's fun. We, we just usually weed a bed or two. Um, and a lot of times I'm doing other stuff, so I don't even get to, like, interact, which I'm kind of bummed about because these are cool people that I definitely want to get to know more and um, chat with. So hopefully more of that kind of stuff um, uh, coming um, but yeah, lately, or the, the last four years, especially with COVID, things were weird. Um, and this is the first year I've done on farm markets too. So like, I'm finally starting to like interact with more people in the community because, you know, I do the CSA and like, I, I, I would deliver in my truck and this year, Chris is, um, uh, Chris Gibbons is still here. He's, he's so cool. He's out he's there. So I saw cool. him just the other, uh, it was this week. Uh, it was two days ago and he's yeah. got like his red shorts on, no shirt. It's like <laughs> 8 a.m. He's just <laughs> slinging this produce. Uh-huh. And I pulled up. I was like, dude, you are doing God's work. Look at you. <laughs> Yeah, he's yeah. great. Yeah, yeah. You know, so um, and he he agreed to he's just volunteered to to deliver the product. And I was like, you realize there's like 90 CSAs, right? Like, <laughs> like it's a big big job. He just starts at eight, and um, he's got to do it in a couple different chunks because obviously he can't fit 90 bags of produce in on, his on little his red golf, golf cart. cart. He can do about 35 though. Just amazing i would not have guessed you could do that much but he's like strapping stuff to it like it's, yeah, it's right. awesome. yeah. we need to get him uh i i always like the idea of having like a little trailer right like we need to get him with like little so, a lawnmower wheels on it like a little wood yeah that just bounces behind so him. i i did buy a bike trailer because of what i think it, it, in the future what i envision is hiring um like a teenager to um do bike deliveries and this would be for more like um just o- online a la carte orders um, and so like, you know, probably I, I, it went, especially as the neighborhood grows and a lot of this stuff, it's growing with the neighborhood and, uh, uh you know, a lot of these amenities and stuff, it, it, it's frustrating, like waiting for them because like you have to build a house first and then you do the other sure. stuff and it's like, oh, yeah, but so like the farm's going to be getting better and better the, through the years, but you know, it's going to take some time to get, but like, um, when, especially when there's more people and like, I, I, I can probably rely on five to ten a la carte orders coming in the day. I just send the guy out on this side. So I've got a bike trailer that I, you know, I'll build a frame and insulate it and stuff and we'll just have, like, bike delivery and yeah. stuff for that. So I, I got visions of that stuff like that. So, um, I dig it. Yeah. Um, is there – and I'm, I'm sure you're just going to say absolutely no way in hell. Is there <laughs> any way that – like, I'm really used to having a green bin. Right. Like some kind of like right. composting bin. And there's like, I don't have, I don't have space in my yard to compost. Yeah. 
is there any any way that you have ever seen like a CSA do some kind of like reclaiming or yeah. compost area or something yeah. like that where it's kind of like, look, say I do have produce or, or right. whatever things, you, I can your bring grass it. Clippings yeah, it. even it's like yeah. I filled up an yeah. entire trash can with grass yeah. clippings yesterday. Yeah. It's like it, it's a lot. And now, by the way, I don't have room for my actual trash, right? Because it's like <laughs> yeah. grass is not yeah. like I don't even consider grass the same as like a plastic yeah. container. Anyway, is there any is there any hope or aspiration or even a way that we could have some kind of community compost? Yeah, there there is. I would love to do it in the future. So maybe we can get into this. The farm probably going to move at some point. Um, I, I'm I'm probably on site for at least two more years. Okay. Um, so, um, but right now, like it, it would be tough to do it now. I don't. I'm not sure where I'd put it. I don't have a tractor to because you got to be yeah, able to turn, turn it. it. And move it and all that stuff. So, um, it, and it's frustrating because Boise does have a really good composting program. Um, mm-hmm. and, and it, they, there's another bin that comes out, and it comes every two weeks, kind of like on the recycle schedule. But this is outside of like the city limits, so we don't have access to that. So there, there might be hope to like it for them to expand that. I don't know who you would need to like try to get that to happen, but like because it's it's a different service that gets in town. And then uh, us on the outskirts here. I had that. that I had to deal with this at the at the other place I live. Now I live in town. I live like Fairview, five mile area. Um, and uh, so I have that green bin for um, for waste like Dude, that. It's great. Would... It's great having it. But yeah, so it, it maybe there'd be a way to expand what the city has and 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 get it. and then and then they pile it up and and water it and do it. and it, it makes pretty good compost. And then every I think if you're just a, a resident paying up on your bills and stuff you can get a yard just for free i think you get one maybe two yards a year yeah um, of and so good like, compost good compost yeah and so like when they do like rick up boise and stuff like a lot of that stuff goes to um well rick up boise actually that those leaves i think get mulched and go to certain place in the foothills where right. they put some um and that but a lot of it of course is just going to be going to those bins and it's going to make comp- yeah it's great and that's like maybe five years ago, five to seven years ago that started. So it's fairly new even for Boise. Um, but yeah, I do envision if it's in a, a different spot, I'll probably get hopefully a little more land um, to do stuff. And I, we'll have a section I would love to do on-site composting. and Because um, that just, it's again, part of the system. And it, yeah, it right. Like good. bring it back to the system. Yeah. Like let's, let's yeah. you know, I eat stuff or I, I lose stuff or, you know, like I, I had this little batch of the little baby carrots you guys sent and we put it in the crisper drawer and the back of the crisper drawer somehow got super cold and they all froze. And I was like, no, because I'm a huge carrot carrot hound and i was like no i was so excited about them and i tried like one or two and i was like these are shot they're just done you gotta put it in like a stew or something yeah Yeah, Yeah, that'd be the only thing it was 105 out like i'm (laughs) not not gonna do stew right now yeah because i I thought about that i was like i'll go get a chuck roast you know because sometimes we have potatoes i'm like well i really i actually really like potatoes and stew and some people don't but that's my jam um so i enjoy it and my wife's like we're not making a stew right now like we have our (laughs) ac pumping all day long i'm like i know but it'll cool (laughs) off like it's fine but that's when you just throw the bag in the freezer and you just oh, use it in the... Oh, yeah. that's not a bad idea. Yeah. So a yeah. lot of stuff, if you have too much of, like, it's... It, yeah, for, save a lot of it. There. Like, I, I, I over-purchased strawberries because I've been getting strawberries from Ohana, No-Till Farm out in um, Meridian. I just, I've, I'm friends with them, and they, they've, they're they focusing on a lot of berries and stuff. And so, mm. but blackberries and strawberries, and I, I ordered way too many. And so I got all these, like, strawberries that, like, don't last. Like, they, right. they're, you, have, like, you have to have days. them. Like, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And so we're about it. Uh, four or five days now and so they're they don't look good they still taste great but so what i'm gonna do i'm, I'm just gonna get gallon and freeze them and then sell them for you know, you know yeah a little bit marked down so but the last and so like so if people doing smoothies with strawberries so they'll be able to get that but um i don't know why I would, oh yeah it's just like think about freezing stuff um if if it's not lasting it's stuff that you can right. throw in a stew and the Right, they, or, like, or like a smoothie, like you're saying. Or, like bananas are a great example. Right, or if right. you're like too many tomatoes, like a, a good way to do tomatoes is actually just whole. Just put them in a freezer bag, freeze it. And then in the in the winter when you're doing your soups or stews or whatever, hot water will take that skin right off the frozen oh, tomato and you just throw snap. that whole thing. Yeah, so little That's little, a great idea. Like, yeah, um, we're, we're probably going to do a cooking class in September with Lena, who's a rock star. She's been helping out with farm stuff a lot. Um, and do um, 
a, like a, a, a canning class, uh, just a you know a quick thing. Let's talk about food preservation, um, especially going into fall. That's when people are doing that stuff. And, yeah. Uh, tell me about this dinner that you guys are doing this weekend because I yeah. saw the thing go out and. Like, first off, it seems like you guys are going to hit, like, a real big, nice spread. Like, right. talk it's, to me about it's it. It's posh. It's, like... It's bougie. Yeah. So, um, I, obviously, farm dinners are awesome. Another, like, thing you can see on Instagram a lot, like, of, of these um, things. And so, it, it, I've, I've wanted to do one for a while. Um, and uh, Stephen kind of really took it on in the spring to do um, at Stephen Hunter Homes, and um, he because he wanted to do one, uh, he knew that the hunters wanted to d- uh, do it as well. Um, and uh, it, yeah, she, we got he got um, Chef Sarah Kelly from Petite Four, who's like the she's the first female James Beard Award chef in town, um, which is pretty awesome. And so like really great. So I've worked with her in the past with my old farm too. She was buying my tomatoes when she had her bluebird sandwich shop downtown and so i, I i've known her it's, it's and it's it's great but yeah i mean it's, it's lamb like three wine pours and so not really like like i i'm going to be there but it's because i'm the farmer like i would not be able to pay 150 dollars a plate for this thing so it's it's a lot it is it's it's going to be really awesome um you know it's t- nice tables that we rented in the in the um you know, tent and stuff. And so, yeah, it's, it's, it's going to be really awesome and, and, and pretty cool. Um, and first one, and y- yeah, I mean, yeah, higher, higher price point, which <laughs> yeah. we'll, we'll, we'll be, do- like we'll be doing more there. in the future. Yeah. Like next year, I, I hope to do two, one in the spring, one in the fall. I'm, I'm worried about the heat, like seven o'clock, seven thirty on, um, on this Saturday is going to be pretty hot still, but oh, we got some misters to go on the sides. Hopefully it, um, keep that down but i'd like to do like a something in the spring maybe like may or june and then um early june um because it gets hot pretty quick here um and then uh and then something more like september probably last year and and one of those being more of a you know the 60 100 yeah, right. price point at the most right. you know um so yeah more common but um yeah i'm super excited about it i'm I just stressed but I gave, I gave her the produce the other day and so like I don't really do much at this point. Like I just got to set up the thing, but, uh, and, um, try to do a little more cleanup, but, um, before it happens on Saturday, but yeah, super stoked about it. That's it's awesome. Be fun. What are the, what are the big, uh, produce pieces that you like, obviously probably salads and stuff, but like, what are the, yeah. actually she didn't take any of my salad mix. She didn't uh, want it. Yeah. Um, uh, um, which I, I, that's what I've tried to do. I, like with the CSA and stuff, like I really try to always have some lettuce in there because I know people like it. And it, it, we, we were talking earlier about like feeding a community and stuff. And like, like yeah, you're, we are not anywhere close to like ha- being that sort of like self-sufficient. And mm. there might not even be an argument to do that. I think we need to, like, zooming way out, we do need to get uh, more um, resilient, um, get, be able to absorb shocks to the system if they ever happen. Like if the power goes out, we want to be able to like – pivot quickly and be able to like grow actual food rather than just like come on anyway that's a totally different topic <laughs> sorry no, I, um, I appreciate but I appreciate yeah so uh, you know i but i'm like if i am so goals wise like if i can replace a decent portion of some, a, de- a decent portion of the lettuce in this community's fridges <laughs> refrigerators in their houses um like that's a great goal like i yeah. i uh, so um uh, but uh, she took a bunch of, uh, like, she's going to do some sort of spread with eggplant. I gave her, like, 20 pounds of eggplant. Um, um, uh, peppers that she's going to do an awesome thing with. Um, tomatoes, of course. Um, uh, what else she take? Um, the eggplant, yeah, like eggplant seems like the voodoo That's, vegetable. Like, you got to grill it you, with the skin off. It's tough. Get, get it, blend it. Like, what is that, baba yeah. ganoush or something? Yeah. Like, you got to – but, like, it's yeah. such a process. I'm used it to, is. like, this it's is a, a carrot. Yeah. You wash it and you eat it. But eggplant, it's like throw it on open charcoal. Like, yeah. rip them the, with a the thing and the de it and the blah, blah. blah. It's like and Some people are just like, I don't like eggplant. Um, and so it's one of the I, – I only give it, like, once or maybe twice a year. <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah, my dad. I had a stone. horrible experience with eggplant when I was a kid. Uh, I've, I've like marked, taste aversion. That no, bad, oh my dad. Okay, so my dad didn't know how to cook eggplant. Surprise. Anyway, so <laughs> he he rounds it like he does these slices, and then he fries it in a pan and puts it on a plate, and it's this gelatinous, yeah. shaky 
kind of blob. The is weird already with it. Yeah. Right. And it's like that's why if, if you make like a, a, like a, a thick sauce that you're like scooping out of or something, like it doesn't look like eggplant anymore. Yeah. And it's it's great and it's awesome and mm-hmm. it's totally fine. Or like some Thai food does, does it really well with right. like small slices and things like that and soups or, or curries. That's all fine. But if you want to fry it. Like, are you insane? Yeah. <laughs> it's the most – oh, it's very – so I can't – like, I have a great respect for people who can mess around with eggplant. But – and I enjoy it only because it no longer looks like eggplant. Like, yeah. it's something right. else. Yeah, exactly. By the time you cook it correctly, it is on a platter with some other things and you're dipping into it. It is something else. Like, yeah. it is not some gelatinous round right. of goofiness. Right. Yeah, and she'll, so it's going to be an, an awesome spread. Yeah. She was telling me about how she's going to make it. It's going to be really good. That's awesome. Um, well, uh, if you ever need help, pay, yeah. if you ever need help in the in the future, I can roast a whole pig. So if yeah, you want to do, like, a whole – I was yeah. talking to Trish Nandis about yeah. this. If you guys want to do, like, a, a, a farm thing where – you know, like we do an entire pig and then we have like all this stuff around yeah. it. I mean, that like I have this fantasy of having a pig on like a long slender table, yeah. right? And people are just, you know, like getting yeah. this big, these big chunks of bread and you know, well, salads well, and stuff. Well, let's talk about that. I could, I mean, in, off the air, but Different like I'd, I'd love to do that at the end of this year, like as a sort of maybe like beginning of October, oh, like yeah. harvest time of year thing out there that's not like a dinner thing and more yeah. just like a hey come out and yeah right we're gonna enjoy the last of this produce and um yeah so yeah because we you can it. do a yeah. hundred pound pig i i think it costs like all in it was like 500 bucks right right so yeah. and, and that's a hundred pounds fine like you can feed a lot of people and you yeah. throw in a lot of other like somebody does cornbread a lot of cornbread like somebody <laughs> does cornbread somebody does beans yeah. and you just like you yeah. have cornbread beans pig I mean, like, everybody's yeah. eating and having a great time. Somebody brings yeah. some beer or whatever, or, you know, yeah. whatever, LaCroix. You know, we'll get whatever. Chris to bring a keg. Yeah. yeah. God <laughs> bless him, man. Listen, I got to let you go. I so appreciate yeah. your time here. I appreciate what you do for the community. I I was ill-prepared for how awesome this was. Yeah. Like, I, I thought it was going to be yeah. good. I was like, I have some real I questions. I didn't even get into the story of how I got it, but, like, so let's do it again. Yeah. yeah. God, yeah, I guess come, we have to now. Come out to the um, markets that I do every Tuesday um, night, I, I'm pretty full on the CSA, so like it, it's hard to have people join. And like I said, the bags, I'm not gonna be super happy with the bags going for uh, for the end of this year. So, um, but yeah, I, it, come out to the farm if you want to check it out it, anytime. I don't lock anything. This is your farm. Uh, pretty soon here, I'm gonna open it up um, the flowers to you pick, um, oh, and awesome. you can just kind of come out. I, I, I have a couple like events that I need the flowers for at the moment, but after that, it'll just I'll just be like have at it, um, and um, yeah, I just like I said, I'm, I'm getting uh, that Tuesday market. It's been way more successful than I thought it'd be. I thought I'd be like sitting there with my bow, just waiting for people to show up and just like <laughs> your bow. Like, I just, uh, like, yeah. like my vision was like, oh, I, I know a couple of hunters that are, that are that are doing, and so like maybe we can just sit there and have, and I'll just help people out when they come to the market. But no, like I've had lines and ah. it's like so, it, and even when it's been super hot, when I thought I wouldn't have anybody coming out, you guys have been coming out. So thank you so much felt the love from from that just that you guys are coming out so um but yeah i i i've purchased meat from thomas cattle company they, they got their beef uh mcintyre i'm getting eggs and whole chickens from and so like yeah hunter homes had we bought a freezer and so now we can, i'm able to sell that meat out of there and um and then uh, it's, in addition to the regular produce and stuff and then and then you know like su- supplements from other farms like the like the berries from ohana and all that stuff so yeah thanks for making that such a big success I, I, it's doing way better than i thought it would and um yeah excited for it to grow and and yeah. keep getting better every year yeah, yeah awesome well cool. again i appreciate Cheers, you man. sir thank you this- yeah. we chased our pleasures here dug our treasures there